So yes, this is a two-hour burger tutorial, which seems excessive, but I made sure that this is the most detailed hamburger tutorial that will ever exist. In this uh, tutorial series that I've compressed into a single video, you are gonna learn how to make the buns procedurally using geometry nodes. You're gonna learn how to make the patty uh, using procedural materials, using cloth simulation to drape cheese over it. We're gonna be talking about how to give a two-dimensional image with an alpha channel thickness, and then distort it for the bacon, the lettuce, stuff like this. We're also gonna be making uh, tomatoes, of course, and the the point is, this hamburger I didn't just make using simple like project from view for this whole thing, no. Uh, I used a lot of new techniques. You're gonna learn about volumetrics, geometry nodes I've already mentioned. So I've taken all parts from, you know, the, that I've already uploaded. I've cut out the outros because, you know, the, the, there's no need for them. I've put them back for back, back to back uh, for your viewing pleasure. So I just, before we start, I just wanna ask one thing. Uh, if you enjoy these tutorials and you wanna get not only the bun file, but exclusive perks like, like this at uh, Patreon exists. Uh, but other than that, I, I think that's the only promo I'll do. Enjoy the two hour hamburger tutorial and I'll see you on the other end. You know, a wise man once told me, actually stopped me on the street just to say this, I thought it was weird at the time, but what he told me is that the best hamburger always begins with the bun. And I've been carrying that with me all this time, and I think it's about time that I let that information loose and give it to somebody else. So, uh, we're gonna be making a hamburger in like a three or four part series, and part one is gonna be making the buns. Uh, but the twist uh, with this one is we're gonna be using geometry nodes, since I want this to be entirely procedural, uh, specifically for placing the sesame seeds. So, uh, with Bunder open, I want to make sure that you have, you need to make sure, really, uh, that you have 2.93 or 2.92 and above, because uh, Geometry Nodes does not exist in earlier versions. So make sure you're up to date, and other than that, uh, make sure you get a reference image. Here's the hamburger we're going to be using. I don't know if this is a Wendy's, a McDonald's, a Burger King burger. All I know is that it looks very good, and we're going to be using it for reference, okay? So, bunch of layers, bunch of stuff to do, don't have time to waste, let's make the buns, okay? Uh, so the first part in any process is just obliterating the default scene. Let's just get rid of it, and we're going to go to the side view, and let's import in some reference. I'm just going to use this hamburger. Boop. You can literally just drag and drop. I don't know if it's new, I don't know if it's old, but it's a thing, okay? Um, and pretty much for all of this, we're going to be using the reference image just to model everything uh, to scale, at least proportionate to each other, okay? So, we have our image. Let's model the bun. To do this, shift A, uh, we're going to do a cylinder. Why a cylinder? Because this thing is rotationally symmetric, right? It's almost as if this thing's kind of a distorted cylinder already. And if we have a, a side view of this, then we can easily kind of make it using only that information, okay? Uh, so with the cylinder, edit mode, wireframe, just so we can see the whole thing and actually select all these vertices, otherwise it's not gonna work. Um, with this thing, uh, first of all, let's position it kind of in the right spot, edit mode, and I'm gonna take these top vertices and bring them down so they are the correct height, okay? So I'm moving on the Z axis, which moves like all of this, uh, the, the entire ring together is a good way to think about it, okay? Um, okay, we have our cylinder placed. Next, I want to start like scaling these rings so they're roughly the right size. We can add in more rings by Control R. They're called loop cuts, but I'm calling them rings like a, a Sonic type character. You, you know, I don't know how much you guys know about the furry. I, I know this is a bit of a tangent. I don't know. And before I get into the story, I'm just going to be adding loop cuts and scaling. Uh, that's why it's not important. Um, either way, I don't know how far down you've got. You guys have gone down the furry rabbit hole. But uh, one, one thing you'll find surprising is that 90, 95% of it is all like Sonic based. I don't know if it's just like, oh, Sonic's like the place to be or if that was just the origin of the fetish. <laughs> uh, but that, that, that might just be. By the way, I'm going to be doing a sponsored thing at the end of this, at the end of the series. Hopefully they don't mind. You know, I'm just trying to pass the time. I'm trying to keep it PC. I'm trying to keep it PC. Um, either way, you, you'll, you'll find it surprising how, mo how much of it is Sonic and Knuckle-based. You wouldn't expect them to be there, but whatever. Okay, uh, we have a bun. Uh, it kind of looks kind of looks bad, <laughs> uh, but what we can do is we can take this, add in a subdivision surface modifier, and now we have a smooth bun. Of course, we're going to get some pull uh, issues. You're going to see this uh, triangle uh, fan, right? This weird shading. Um, we can either like smooth that out or what's even better, you know, we want to add in some geometry, okay? Uh, so we're going to go to edit mode. We're going to take this, and uh, we can inset it. And you can see this is just going to take the issue and kind of inset or offset the um, where we see it, the visibility of it to the sender. So we're just kind of taking this and moving the problem away, okay? Uh, so what I want you to do, inset, just pretty far in, and we're also going to add in a bit more geometry. Uh, by the way, the reason we're doing this 
is I'm thinking I, I want more than just the sesame seeds to be procedural. I also want to be able to control the shape of the bun procedurally, right? It's not going to be just this perfect, like, cylindrical thing. I want it to have distortion and stuff. So we're going to do displacement. So, you know, add in some geometry. Either way, uh, th th that was just uh, surprising to me. Moving on, uh, take this, Shade Smooth. We're going to apply a displace modifier. Important thing about the displace modifier, it is in in order, right? Um, it is after the subdivision surface, right? These are going to give different results once we actually use a texture, okay? So first we add in geometry, then we displace. Um, how are we going to do it? We're going to do it with a texture. So again, you just hit new. Uh, which texture? We're going to load in the one we just created. Uh, we can use clouds, and that's just like a base... Uh, uh, I don't know, procedural. It's a, it's a generated noise that comes with Blender, okay? Couple settings, size, you want to bring it up. This is just kind of like the scale of the distortion. If you kind of look at the size of this image, uh, we want there to be very little detail. So it actually is big, uh, low frequency kind of stuff. It basically, I'm trying to smooth it out, okay? So bring the size up to a big number. The depth you want to keep below because this is kind of like the... Uh, it's kind of like the steps of detail, almost, if you want to think about it. So either keep it at one or two. One is for very smooth. Two adds in a, a bit of bumpiness. Uh, you take this, you take the strength, we're going to set it to zero so it's not there, and then we're going to gradually just add a bit. And you can see, uh, what what does this do? It just adds in a bit of displacement. Kind of looks like you're pushing Play-Doh down. So it's almost satisfying. This might be an interesting way to go on making some stop-motion clay stuff. Okay, either way, uh, we have the first bun. Uh, we're going to be messing with this one again in a bit once we're adding the sesame seeds. I'm just going to save out the scene. Uh, but first, we need to make the bottom bun. And as far as I understand, I don't know why I need a reference for this, right? But in my head, the bottom bun uh, doesn't have any sesame seeds. I really do not know for sure. Um, but I guess I should look at reference to see if that's the case. I don't really know. Uh, scale, shift Z to scale on everything except the Z axis. So it looks like that, right? Shift Z. Uh, that's just a good way to scale. Um, what was the point? The point is that my cylinder's gone. What did I do? Uh, the point is, I don't know if this bottom bun is supposed to have sesame seeds. I'm just not going to add it in for this one. Uh, so this bun's just for show, right? We're going to do all the complex node stuff up here. Um, same process as last time. Just add in some loop cuts. Uh, with that loop cut, you want to scale into where it should be. Also do this with the uh, bottom row and stuff like that. The more detail you add, the better, but it's not too big of a deal because at the end, we're again going to add in a subdivision surface. And uh, by the way, other than the insetting trick, let's go to solid view. So let's do a bit of the insetting trick, just add in some uh, more geometry. And we can also do that on the uh, bottom. So I know the, the, this part's just modeling. It's boring. I mean, there, there's some blunder channels entirely based off of modeling. They seem to do fine, but whatever, I find it boring. Um, a trick other than the insetting, if you want this to be kind of a sharp edge with less of rounding um, after you add the subdivision surface. So this is without, right? It has this crisp edge. Uh, but when we add in the uh, subsurf, where did it go? The uh, subsurf, we get a lot of curvature. Uh, you can add in a loop cut and just bring it very close. And that's going to add in uh, some tightness on that uh, corner. Just a thing. Uh, shade smooth, whatever. I mean, yeah, there, there, there's a bunch of modeling only channels, Josh Gambrel, whatever. They seem to do fine. Uh, for this displacement, I think we can actually use the same texture. But for the strength, we want it to be uh, its own custom value, something like that. Okay. Um, so at this point, we've modeled buns. You know, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to clickbait the shit out of this video. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to call it. Like, lots of buns. Some kind of innuendo. Uh, we've modeled the bun. Actually, let me just add in a bit of crispness, as I was just talking about, uh, to this edge, right? Just so it's a bit more intense. Uh, we've modeled the buns. Uh, we can control this procedurally, right? We can uh, control the displacement to this one and the other one, like, on their own. And we can add in more geometry, um, just by adding in a higher level of subsurf. That's just a thing we can do. Um, but... At this point, we want to be adding in the seeds, and this is where it gets uh, very new. So uh, with the top bun, we are going to do geometry nodes. How? Well, first of all, you add in a geometry nodes modifier, okay? As far as I understand it, without this modifier, you cannot... Um, whatever node tree you create, it will not do anything to the object, okay? So after all of this, right, in the modifier stack, we're then going to apply geometry nodes. Then for what geometry nodes are we going to be using? you go to the geometry node editor, just like the shader editor or anything like that, or compositor or anything that has nodes, right? You shift A to find the nodes. I'm assuming you haven't touched geometry nodes at this point, so I'm just gonna do a bit of a crash course. Uh, shift A to search, and um, this is like, this uh, tree is gonna be linked uh, to this. So I think we should be able to rename this to like burger or something like this, and then you can see like updates here, okay? Uh, so whatever node stuff we do here, I want you to think of this as we're basically making a custom modifier is the idea. 
is the idea, okay? Um, so what do, what do we want this modifier to do? Well, in essence, we want it to take an object like a sesame seed, which we're going to model, and I want it to scatter it in a very specific way. Now, good question, while I make the uh, sesame seed, we talk about both of them at the same time. A uh, good question here is why do I not just like model the sesame seed and then instead of doing all this like geometry node stuff, why don't I just do it with particles? Well, first of all, uh, wouldn't get as many views. <laughs> That's one thing. But um, mainly geometry nodes, even with scattering, like this uh, simple thing gives us uh, much more control. So I'm just going to, first of all, let's smooth this out. Kind of same uh, process as before. We can also solidify, although this time we want it to be in the other order. So I'm taking the mesh, I'm adding some thickness uh, with solidify, and then I'm smoothing uh, with this. Uh, back on topic, uh, geometry nodes uh, actually gives us some scattering options that uh, particles do not, and we can control a lot of stuff. And uh, specifically, I'm going to be solving the issue that uh, even Blender Guru can't, where the sesame seeds should not intersect, right? Uh, when you scatter with particles, it's usually an issue uh, where some particles are going to be overlapping when we're instancing the objects. Uh, this has a way to get around that, and I'm actually kind of excited to, uh, to show it because it's kind of a big deal. Okay, anyways, uh, I've rambled enough uh, trying not to stutter while making uh, the sesame seed, um, and now we can take this and scatter it uh, using that idea that I was just talking about. We can do it without intersection or overlapping, okay? Uh, to do this, we take our model that has the modifier that has the node tree. We say, what do we want? Shift A, well, it's probably going to be something with points because we want to scatter points and then instance stuff over them. Um, and then we're going to go to point, point distribute. Uh, you could either do it like this, or you could just, uh, you know, search uh, point distribute once you know the name. You just connect it here, okay? Uh, so we've taken this geometry input. We're basically sending it through a point distribution and then sending it out. Um, right now, it's going to get rid of the mesh, but we do have the points and we can control the density and stuff like this, whatever. Um, I want, uh, first of all, to clone or instance the sesame seed on every single point, and then I want to get my uh, burger back, which we need to click uh, through the outliner, I guess. By the way, probably a good time to rename things, so I'm just going to call this uh, Top Boiga, and I'm going to call this one Bottom Boiga. And then uh, this plane is going to be our sesame seed. And as far as I know, uh, having modifiers on the sesame seed, the thing we're instancing, not a big deal, okay? So Top Boiga. Uh, you distribute the points, and then what, what do we want to do? Well, let's actually just do it through the menu. Point, not distribute, but instance, okay? So we've distributed our points, and now for each point we are going to instance, we are going to send a copy of this object, okay? And you can see it's kind of doing what we want, although the sesame seeds are huge, um, and we're still, you probably can't see it, but we still don't have the base mesh under there. Uh, one way to fix this is you can literally take this geometry and scale it down. However, um, we are dealing with nodes, which means we do have a lot of control. Um, so instead of that, let's do something like a point scale, I think is the way to go. So uh, we take point scale. So first we distribute the points, then we're going to modify their size, and then we're going to copy a sesame seed on every one of these. So if I take the point scale, go to vector, in other words, I can control each of these numbers. Well, we then have a uh, controller for this, right? And we can scale only on the x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, whatever. Um, so I'm just going to make them really small, like 0.1 or even like 0.05 for now, and we can change that later, okay? Um, one thing I want you to notice is if you imagine the hamburger bun here, these sesame seeds spawn in kind of normal, flush with the surface, like they're not jutting outwards. They're uh, as if they were like a surfer on the waves. It's a uh, parallel or normal to the surface. It's not normal, the opposite of normal. It's, it's gliding with the surface, okay? So you can see this one's pointing up and they're basically outlining the mesh, okay? Uh, that's going to be important in a bit. But either way, uh, we've scaled them, we've instanced them, and now let's bring back our original geometry. And there's a node for this. It's called join. Uh, geometry basically takes two or three or however many meshes, I think. That's why it has this like weird input, um, which is kind of cool. I think this is a redesign that was done recently. Uh, basically, what this does is it takes an arbitrary number of meshes or maybe just two. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's definitely one of those. And it just uh, combines them together in a way that is faster uh, than the Boolean uh, thing, which could also be used to join, but whatever. Uh, we're going to take this. We are going to join the original geometry. Again, this is our hamburger bun, and we're going to join it with the sesame seeds. So the way you want to think about this, uh, this geometry right here is the bun, and then everything here is the points, the distribution. It's the sesame seeds, okay? We join these. By the way, we can shade smooth. Um, second issue, by the way, you can see that they're there, but they're kind of like intersecting or they're kind of inside the surface. Um, one way to fix this is you could do it with uh, nodes. Uh, for this one, I'm just going to do this edit mode trick. So I'm just going to, you know, select the sesame seed, whatever we're instancing, and then just bring it upwards, okay? And we kind of want to look at it here to see when we're hovering above. So we don't want to go too far. 
for just a bit, okay? Uh, basically, what's happening here is we're just moving it away from its origin and the uh, point distribution, whatever, um, it spawns in the sesame seed at this dot. So if we hover it above, it's going to hover above is the point, okay? Okay, we have sesame seeds. Um, let's uh, mess around with some nodes now, okay? Uh, because we have all this control, let's uh, use these parameters. So density is going to say uh, how many, you know, sesame seeds do we want. Uh, we bring this up, we get more sesame seeds. Again, they're going to be normal to the surface, um, and everything works, although a couple of issues. First of all, it's on the bottom of the bun, right? Here, there should be a transition to like a more bready uh, looking material, and there's not sesame seeds there usually. Uh, so we don't want to spawn them down here. Uh, but second of all, and this is a big deal, I'm probably going to make a standalone video just on this because it's a big deal. Um, these sesame seeds, they're intersecting, okay? Uh, luckily, there's now, finally, there wasn't before, but this is the first time there's a way around this. How do we fix it? We change our point distribution mode, not from random, so just, you know, puts points randomly. Uh, we take that and change it to Poisson, who's a mathematician, a disk. You're going to see when we do this, nothing happens. However, uh, the main difference is we get something called the distance slider. What the distance slider does is it says no two points can be within blank uh, distance. Okay, so right now it's zero, so it's kind of off. But if we increase this, you can see um, now we're, we've essentially gone rid of the intersection because no two points can be within 0.13 distance. Okay, so basically it's using some kind of Poisson disk algorithm. I don't know what it means, but um, it avoids intersection, which is the point. And we can uh, still mess around with all these other sliders. So I want my sesame seeds to be smaller so I can scale them down. Um, I want, I mean, I, I guess that's really it. By the way, we also have a seed thing, so I want to change the seed. And that that's just gives us random distributions. Um, all of these are not going to be intersecting is the point. Okay, cool. Um, another thing, how do we get rid of the thing on the bottom like we talked about? Well, um, if we could paint or use vertex or weight paint or one of these, if we could define a map and say this is where we want or actually don't want sesame seeds, um, then we can import that in this uh, attribute, which we're going to talk about. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to weight paint. I'm going to go to our object. What's this called? Object data vertex groups. You're going to see when we paint, we automatically get a group. Uh, that's important. Okay. So I'm just going to paint. Um, and I, what, what I want you to think about this as is this is the area where we want sesame seeds. So I'm just going to rename this to sesame. Um, I'm pretty sure this name's actually pretty important because this is now an attribute. It's basically data uh, that we can import in. That's what an attribute is. And I think we should be able to just type in this name. Yeah. Um, make sure these names are matching. So if we update it here, you have to update it here. So let's see, if we add an S, yes, it breaks, right? You need to update uh, the S um, in the node. Uh, but what's the point? The point is you can kind of draw a uh, custom seeing like what happens as you do it. And you can also like change the seed at any time. It's still going to obey the distribution law that you've uh, made. Um, we can basically paint an attribute. And uh, the idea of attribute, again, data that we can uh, create or modify or whatever, it's going to be important because we're about to mess with them again. So I'm just going to, you know, do this roughly. doesn't need to be perfect. You can go back and mess with this is the point, uh, which is the, the thing about nodes. It's procedural. We can always go back. Okay. Uh, we have this. Um, speaking of attributes, we want to randomize some of the attributes. For example, each of these points, or I guess you could think of them as the sesame seeds, but really they're spawning on points. Uh, each of these points has an attribute called scale. We actually messed with it right here, right? We changed the scale. Uh, it also has an attribute called rotation. There's an attribute called normal, stuff like this. So we're going to mess with it. So uh, first of all, let's uh, mess with the rotation. So I don't want all the sesame seeds to be pointing. Um, oh, I mean, I do want them to be kind of flush with the surface, but they shouldn't all be pointing like upwards towards the center of the bun like a ant colony. Try it's, it's just creepy, to be honest, right? Um, there, there's some variation. In fact, there seems like there's a lot. Some of them are pointing down, sideways, whatever. Okay, um, so how do we do this? Well, we've distributed the points. Again, order of operations matters. Uh, we've scaled them. And now I want to uh, randomize their rotation. So uh, we go to attributes, and I think, yeah, there's attributes, and there's a whole bunch of stuff just to mess with these things. Uh, we're going to go to attribute randomize, okay? So we take an attribute, whatever it may be. In this case, it's going to be rotation. And you got to memorize these names. It's not rotate. It's rotation. Make sure you spell that correctly. And we want to take the rotation and randomize it, okay? Um, basically, there's a whole bunch of sliders and stuff here. We're not going to mess with too many of them. You can randomize them based off of a single number, which is what float is. You could do a vector, so you can mess only with like the Z rotation and only the Y rotation, whatever. Um, I'm going to do float. So this is just going to mess with all of them at the same time using a single slider, okay? Uh, we've randomized this. 
Um, however, um, even though we've now messed with the rotation, each one of them should now be random uh, from its initial thing and uh, ideally independent from each other. So no sesame seeds are like linked to each other. Um, even though we've randomized it, you can see we still want it to be flushed to the surface. And yesterday, I was going crazy on the little blunder nest discord. I'm like, how do I do this? How do I do this? And I actually ended up answering my own question uh, before anybody could uh, help me with that. So that, that was pretty cool. Uh, the answer is you go to align rotation to vector. I'm assuming the only reason this node exists is to solve this issue. So again, we need to orient these to the normals, okay? So first of all, we've randomized our rotation, this attribute. Now we want to mess with it in a way that it actually respects the normal, the direction outwards of the surface, okay? Um, so you add in this node, okay? Then what do you do? Uh, for the vector that we want to align rotation to vector, right? This is the vector. Um, instead of, you know, putting one in custom that we can, you know, do stuff with, um, I'm going to change this to attribute because each point is going to have a different, like, reference normal of the mesh, okay? Okay. Um, so for this vector, just type in normal, and you can see it updates. Um, and then you just got to pick the right one of these. So Y is almost correct, although it's perpendicular, so it should be Z. And you can see this fixes the issue. Now these are flush uh, with the surface, but we can still randomize these because the um, alignment happens uh, after. If you do this the other way around, uh, you're going to have an issue, okay? So order of operations matters. So you can see now it's like messed up again. So I'm just going to go back to the original. Um, and uh, by the way, we also have a factor to control this, but whatever. And you could do this with an attribute and all this. So you could you could have some sesame seeds kind of poking out if that's what you want. But for me, that's not what I want, okay? Okay, so we've done the rotation. Let's also randomize the scale. So now that they're here, uh, we can change their size. I guess there's probably technically a correct spot for this, but I'm just going to put it here. And I guess we wouldn't need this node anyways, but whatever. Doesn't matter. Attribute, randomize. After their rotation, I want to randomize not their rotation, but their size or scale. And generally, if you can think of the name for this, uh, hopefully the naming convention is what you think it is, okay? Uh, so for the maximum, I want, I guess, 0.035 is what we picked. And for the minimum, in other words, each one of these is going to get a random like scale value. The smallest it could be in zero, is zero. The biggest it can be is 0.035. I want the smallest uh, sesame seed to be like, I don't know, 0.02. So none of them are too small, whatever. And you can mess around with this. So again, um, all of this is procedural. We can increase the density, although it doesn't let us, right, unless we bring down the uh, scale bit so they can be a bit closer. Um, you can mess with all this, mess with the distribution, whatever. But at this point, and by the way, one more thing I want to mention, and then we'll move on to materials. Again, because all of this is basically a custom modifier is the way you want to think about this. Um, and it still respects this hierarchy, uh, we can still at any time change the uh, displacement. And you can see the sesame seeds are kind of sticking with it. It's trying its best. Sometimes it moves so much that it needs to generate uh, new points because the distance between them has like shrunk. Uh, it's kind of like something to do with geodesics. Don't worry about it if you don't know anything about like differential geometry or whatever. Uh, but you can see this uh, moves uh, with it. However, if we were to put this above, you're going to notice that now uh, it's not working the way it's supposed to because now it's also displacing the sesame seeds. Um, so order matters. If you take anything away from this tutorial other than the whole furry thing from before, <laughs> uh, take away this order hierarchy stuff mattering, okay? Okay, cool. So we've done that. Let's do uh, materials. And for this, um, I guess ideally you, you just want to do some like projection textures and stuff like this. Um, but for my purpose, I'm just going to do some like procedural material stuff because it seems like we're doing everything procedurally here, okay? Uh, shader editor. Um, we're going to make a material, I guess, first of all, for the sesame seed, then for the top bun, and then a very similar one for the bottom bun, maybe even identical, okay? Um, so starting off uh, with the sesame seed, or I guess with our render scene, let's uh, switch over to cycles just so I get like a good render result. So I want to kind of set up my lighting and environment. I'm going to go to film. Enable transparent. This is just going to make your background invisible. Why do I do this? Uh, because I'm going to add in an HDRI, right? This is to add in lighting without actually adding in lights. You got to be lazy, right? Um, and I don't want to see it in the background. Okay, that's why I did it. So you go to environment texture in the world tab. And I'm going to load in which environment texture? Uh, one of these. HDRI Haven, any website you could shoot your own. Uh, basically, this is the scene our hamburger is going to exist in. Um, and we could always like swap them out at any time. For this time, for this one, I'm just gonna use this one because I like it. Okay. Um, cool. So we have our lighting. Let's start off with our sesame seed. We make a material, call it Sesame Street Seed. I spelled it as Sesame Steed. 
hilarious. Um, sesame seed. What do we do with it? Well, uh, anything we do to this material, because it's applied to this, is going to be instanced on every single one of these, right? That's the beauty of this. We don't need to make 100 materials, right? We make one here, and then the copying happens. Um, so ideally, you could hit, hit a E for eyedropper or extract, like I used to call it, and then like sample the color. Although I found that, you know, there's already lighting and stuff baked into this. So maybe you could try to sample kind of like a yellowish tint. And, uh, you know, that kind of works. Um, however, uh, you could always put in the color manually. So I'm just going to desaturate this a bit. And we can always play around with this later. Okay, we have sesame seeds. We can make some of them darker, some of them whatever. But for now, I'm okay with it. Um, next, uh, let's move to the top bun. Uh, we make a material. We're going to call this top bun. Or should I say top gun? Ha, ha, ha. Okay, top bun. <laughs> uh, what do we want to do to this? Well, first of all, uh, we want it to be kind of a burgery type color. So again, you hit E. Uh, while hovering over this E, and then you can just click anywhere on the screen. Um, and we get a nice color. Dude, this reminds me of the SpongeBob uh, GameCube game I used to play. I used to be obsessed with the Krabby Patty, as I think a lot of people were. There. It's like, I know it's a show, but I actually do want to know how it's made, right? Um, what was the point? The point is we pick a color. Um, is it reflective? I don't know. I mean, it seems to be kind of shiny, but this is kind of like a set dressing. So I'm just going to bump up the roughness so it ain't as uh, shiny or as reflective. Uh, for the color, I don't want it to be just a single color. And by the way, we're going to deal with this bottom part uh, later. Uh, but for now, let's just deal with the top. I want to have some variation. Uh, so to do this, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a noise texture. So again, noise texture. It's varied across the surface. And I'm going to use this to mix RGB. So this is going to be the uh, factor. It's going to be the uh, where is this happening kind of uh, slider, right? Um, I'm going to use this with multiply, and I'll explain it in a sec. So first of all, I'm going to copy this color over. So control C, control V, uh, plug this in right here, and view it. Um, the idea is I want to multiply this color uh, by black. Uh, why do I do that? Well, uh, the idea is we take this original color, and wherever we multiply this with black, it should get darker. Well, where are we going to multiply it? Uh, wherever this uh, noise is. So you can see some areas are darker than others. So uh, because of this, I think I'm going to brighten up the bun just a bit and maybe make it yellower. I don't know. No, that kind of looks like a potato now. We can always mess with it. Uh, this is a good way to add in variation. So now we can actually mess with the quality of our uh, noise. Well... Uh, what do I want? Well, I want texture coordinates. I'm going to set this to object coordinates just because I know it's never distorted. Uh, generated coordinates tend to be a bit stretched. Although I do believe they move with deformation. So if you move the displacement, it might be useful. Either way, I'm going to bring down the scale so it's kind of like low frequency changes, maybe even lower. Um, let's see what that looks like. I do want it to be a little less subtle than that. So we add in a color ramp just to bump up the contrast. So you can see we're making the dark areas darker. And we can make them even darker. Although if you go too far, if you go too far, like you put them right next to each other, uh, you're going to get this. This is more like uh, what a, uh, how am I, how am I going to do this? This is more what a fill in the word in your head. It's a, no, it's a woman who wears a certain kind of leopard print. You understand. Uh, this is a good way to add in some variation. And we can always mess around with this later. Um, some things I like to do with this is I always like to bring up the detail just so the boundary uh, between these is more detailed than, you know, this, right? I want a lot of detail, maybe a bit of roughness so it's a bit more distributed. I don't know, something like this. We can always play around with it later. Um, this is a good start, okay? Uh, there's more things we can do. We can also do the same kind of, and you know what, whatever. I'll just do it. Uh, we can add in another noise texture. The idea here is before we even do this multiplication, I'm going to sample two colors, so not just this one, but I'm going to make like a modified kind of yellowish version, so just two colors. Same idea as before, noise texture, this time instead of multiply, uh, you set it to mix, mix, and make sure to set the uh, seed value to something different, just so it's not using the same pattern for where to darken and where to vary. Um, so the idea here is, let's bring down a color ramp, is I want uh, some parts to be orange, some parts to be yellow, I'm sure there's a rule to this if you actually know what baking is. I don't, um, so I'm just going to do it. So you can see there's a bit of variation. And then we uh, send this through here, and then it gets darkened. Um, so all of this is just to say we're adding in variation. That's the point. Um, secondly, how do we do this? Um, or you know what? Not secondly. Let's finish the bun, or the top part of the bun. Um, it's smooth. It shouldn't be smooth. There should be crackles and a bit of noise and stuff like that, so let's add it in. Uh, this is all going to be normal information. 
Um, so let's add in yet another, and this is where it gets a bit risky. You don't want to add in too many noise textures if you can help it. It just slows down to render, um, but whatever, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to take noise texture. We're going to do this. We are going to set the number. Let's use object coordinates again uh, to remove distortion. I'm going to set the scale to something like huge, just so we have very fine detail. So this is like the grain of the, I don't, I know nothing about baking. Either way, this is like the quality of the bread. Uh, we're going to take this. We want to convert it into normal mapping. Bump node does that. What, what does it do? Um, it takes height information. In other words, just black and white image. Takes it and converts it into normal information using the gradient, blah, blah, blah. You connect it to normal. Um, and you can see this is just going to give it more of a bread-like uh, quality. And you might want to like bring down the strength of this. Although, instead of bringing down the uh, strength here, uh, what you could always do is um, before it even reaches the height, you're going to multiply it by like a small number. So 0.5 makes it half as strong. 0.1 makes it like a tenth as strong. And then 0 makes it not even be there. So I'm going to do something very light, it seems. So like 0.05. And then we could even make it even a bit smaller, like 300. And this really does help it look like uh, bread. So this is before. It's kind of too smooth. And after. Okay, it's kind of a big deal. Um, and we can always change this stuff later. But for now, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, at this point, no, 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 we should add in the cracks. I don't know if I actually will, but let me just show you how to do it. Boron. <laughs> what? Uh, you want to add in a Voronoi texture for this one, because this is an easy way to generate cracks. Uh, you change this from F1 to, I think, distance to edge, or maybe smooth F1. I guess you have a couple options. Distance to edge is kind of the obvious way to add in some cracks, but I do like smooth F1. Um, either way, you take this, same thing as before, you do a color ramp. This is just to define some like lines and stuff like this, and you want these to be pretty harsh. Uh, so we're going to bring up the scale just so they're smaller. You know what? At this point, I'm going to go distance to edge. Um, but same idea. This is just to add in a bit of crackle to the bread. So I'm making this like very hyper sharp. And I guess we could kind of reverse this so this is black and the lines are white. It shouldn't matter too much, but you know, it's a thing you can do. I want to bring this really close and maybe make the crackles a little bigger. Um, this is just something we can also incorporate into our bump node. Well, how do we do both the uh, noise, right, um, and this? Uh, well, just to combine anything, you always kind of do addition. It's just kind of the way you want to think about it. So uh, it won't look uh, great. kind of looks uh, horrible, in fact. Uh, but you can see this is a way you add cracks. Again, how do you make it look better? Uh, you can either add in a multiply right here to make it softer. Or, in fact, since we have a color ramp, you could just bring down the bright areas closer to black. The closer it is to black, uh, the less visible it will be. Okay? Um, and you can also play with the scale just to see what would look good. So do I want it to be a very small number? Maybe. Or maybe do I want it to be a very big number? I don't know. Um, but the point is, you can always mess around with this. But you don't want it to be too visible, is the idea. Okay. Um, I'm going to call this part of the bun done. Let's talk about how to do this bottom part uh, where it's just bread and stuff like that. Like, how do we transition between two materials? Well, uh, we could either do that with a selection, right? We, we select all of these faces on the bottom. However, then we're going to have an incredibly sharp edge. Um, instead, what I like to do is we are going to make a custom transition, okay? How are we going to do that? Well, if we take a coordinate system, I guess generated, we can play around with these, uh, separate by x, y, z. So I'm taking generated coordinates. I'm saying, oh, we could separate by x, y, z. Um, the z one is going to be black at the bottom, and then it's going to rise to one, okay? Uh, so in other words, we're going, uh, imagine the bounding box, the cube that contains this. The bottom of the cube is z equals zero. The top of the cube is z equals one, okay? Um, this is a great way to make a transition. Why? Uh, because if we were to use something like a math, I don't know, a math, you could either do a greater than just to make a cutoff, or if you do a subtract, and the idea here is you could do kind of a soft cutoff. Either way, you can separate top and bottom is the idea, okay? Well, what do we want to do with this? Well, first of all, let me make it a bit sharper, just so one doesn't bleed into another. So I'm just going to bring this over here, just so the transition's harsher, but still not like a perfect line, like the, the greater than's too intense, right? So there's just a bit of a fade. Uh, what do I want to do with this? Well, I want to add in another BSDF, I guess a principled BSDF. So I want you to think of uh, all this, everything we've done, one material, and this BSDF's another material. We mix them together. By the way, that's control shift right click drag if you care. Um, you use this as the factor. So let's connect this as the factor. And I guess I flip them. 
And now you can see we basically have control of the top, which is the same thing as before, nothing's changed. Uh, but the bottom is now completely controlled by this BSDF. Why? Because we're mixing them. How are we mixing them uh, with this factor? Okay, cool. Uh, so what do we want? Well, first of all, uh, let's work on the boundary. And once we've worked on the boundary, let's work on what the bottom will actually look like. So I want it to be kind of there. I want it to be a bit sharper, like 0.04. Um, but mainly, mainly, you can see it's not very even, right? Some of it's, it's kind of like a wave. It shouldn't just be this like perfectly straight line going across. Um, well, how do we add in uh, this distortion? Here's where it gets a bit complicated. Uh, don't worry about it too much if you don't understand the math. Uh, we want to mess with the texture coordinates here before we even separate by X, Y, Z, right? So if this is all going to depend on our uh, Z coordinate, well, if we can mess with it before it even gets there, well, then it's going to be distorted. How do I do this? Well, we add in yet again another noise, and we might be able to outsource one of these from before, although they're not really the right setting. So I'm just going to add in yet another noise texture. It might slow it down, but whatever. You take these two ideas, this coordinate system and this noise, which is effectively just randomness, and we want to combine them. So you can do it like that, I believe. So that is going to mix. I guess we should use the color just to get X, Y, and Z information, or RGB. Uh, we're going to mix these two together. So in other words, we're taking our coordinate system that was here before, just generated coordinates. We're adding in randomness. And uh, you're going to notice it doesn't really do what you expect. Um, there's a reason for this point is it the random values on average adding 0.5 so there's a shift happening don't worry about it set this to linear light okay this is going to take care of it there's a way to do this manually but this is just a way to take care of it okay uh, we're going to do that do it like this before we mess around with this too much i just want to raise uh this a bit more just so we have a bit more leeway and the way i want you to think about this is this slider Basically, what it shows is how much distortion there's going to be. And I think we might want to flip these. Yeah, uh, it's going to show the distortion of the boundary. OK, so let's uh, view it from the side. Um, so when it's zero, we get a flat line. When it's a bit more, we get um, distortion. What does the distortion look like? It's dependent on the noise. OK, um, so first of all, let's bring this back down because I guess I had it flipped. So this is the boundary between materials in some sense, even though this is all one container, one material. It's really the boundary between BSDFs. Uh, we want to have this be a high detail boundary, so like very sharp uh, stuff going on. Also high roughness, maybe. So this is low roughness. It's kind of soft. High roughness makes it kind of battered, and it's noisy is the point. And then this slider is just how much overall noise should there be. Uh, the issue is if you bring it too low, um, if you don't have your subtraction, like your cutoff set high enough, right? Um, if you do not have that, you're going to have this issue. So you just want to bring it low enough. Uh, that the whole bottom is kind of filled in, but also I guess we could raise raise the boundary just a bit to give us a bit of leeway, uh, but not too high that there's that issue. So I'm just going to mess around with these values until I roughly get what I want. And I think that's good. I mean, it should be a bit lower. So let's bring it lower and then let's mess with this until we don't have too much of that issue. A tiny bit isn't the biggest deal. Okay, cool. So now we've uh, defined a custom boundary again. This is all for the factor of this mixed shader, which means you change the color, it only affects the bottom. Okay, uh, now that we have control of this area, what do we want it to look like? Well, it should be bread, and I think this part's extremely rough, like it shouldn't be reflective, so like something like 0.9 roughness, I don't know. Um, it should look like that. Uh, for the color, for the color, I believe we want it to be like slightly yellow. I don't know, we can mess around with this later. Just a bready color, I think that's a good one. Um, then what do I want to do with it? The main thing that makes it look like bread is it's kind of porous and stuff like that. In other words, normal mapping. The same thing that made this look like a, a bun. It's the bump, right? Uh, to do this, we're going to do Voronoi because it's good for this kind of stuff. Different kind of noises or textures are good for different scenarios. We're going to use Voronoi because uh, the way it's generated is it scatters a bunch of points, kind of like point distribute. <laughs> um, it scatters a bunch of points and uh, gives us the distance from them or distance to the closest point. In other words, it's a bunch of circles is the point. And that's what bread is. It's kind of like porous circles, like a sponge. Uh, we take this, we bring up the scale to increase the number of circles. So you can see now you can really see what's going on here. Uh, we take this, we filter it as always through a color ramp just to get a bit more control here. So I'm thinking we bring this up and then you can really start seeing the circles. Uh, we take this, we filter it through a bump, and then we can always mess with, around with it later. Again, we convert it. We take height, right? And we convert it into normal information. And now let's see what it looks like. Okay, it's a good start. It doesn't look good. Uh, but 
to make it look good. I guess it's looking not porous enough, so let's bump this up to like 100. And maybe that's too much, maybe like 75. Uh, you can see, oh, there's hammering on outside. Sorry about that. Um, th this is a good way to start. You can also change the randomness value. This is gonna make it a grid, <laughs> right? This is Voronoi as a grid. I guess you wanna keep randomness at full. Um, but some other things you could play around with, I haven't messed around with this too much. You can change the uh, type of Voronoi nonsense to different things. I don't know what all of these mean, uh, but some of them look more like bread. I think F2 kind of looks better than F1. And then you could also play around with uh, what is smooth F1. Well, it's F1 where you can like choose how sharp the cutoff is going to be. In my case, I think F2 is kind of the way to go. It really does kind of look like bread. It really does. Um, only thing I would change here, this uh, cutoff, um, that is again the factor, I feel like it could be a bit sharper, so I'm just going to bring this again closer, just so it's a bit of a harsher thing. Uh, you could also add in some noise here, or some random color, um, just in the same method as we did before, like nothing changes. Um, however, at this point we're really starting to add in too many noises if we do that. Do that. It's not a big deal, uh, but it's just a thing. Okay. Um, at this point, uh, let's make the bottom bun. This time I'll speed through it because you already know the process. Um, we just need to basically change some sliders. So we're gonna take our top bun material. We're gonna create a clone of it. So this is now not the same top bun material, right? This is different. If we change a node here, um, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't copy it over to the other one. It's independent. Uh, so this one's gonna be bottom bun. Um, generally, everything should be the same. The only difference is this bread line uh, should be at a different spot, right? Because it's at a different area. Well, how do we find it? Well, now, uh, generated coordinates refer to this object, where uh, z, z0 is here, um, and z1 is up here. Uh, we kind of want to flip um, everything we've been doing. So if we bring the subtraction, I don't know, it's one of these directions, the color ramp might be the issue. So for now, let's actually just view it like this. Uh, we want to bring it up. So instead of 0.02, maybe it's like 1 minus 0.02. I think that makes sense. Uh, we take this, we send it through the color ramp, and I think the color ramp settings should be fine. Seems like it's fine. Let's see what it looks like. No, it's inverted. Well, easy fix. Uh, we could either flip the uh, color ramp or uh, you can flip these sockets like that. Um, okay, we need to change the settings just a bit because you know different objects are distorted uh, to different amounts. Uh, well, uh, I guess we just want to bring this down a bit. And... Um, you could, ch I guess we want it to be a bit lower. I guess uh, since these are independent from each other, we can have different uh, noise values. So maybe this one, I want the boundary to be super noisy because it seems like it would be a little too sharp otherwise. Um, I think that's pretty good. Um, is anything technically different in the bottom bun? It seems like it's a bit brighter, less cooked. I don't know. Again, I don't know anything about this. Um, so what we could do is if that's the case, uh, we can make these colors that it's using slightly brighter. So this is just to make the bottom bun brighter. Again, the, the reason this could be uh, looking this way is because of our lighting situation, where um, well, whatever HDRI we have, again, don't forget, we have a lighting environment. Um, it might just be causing that. But you can see this is a good start. It really looks good. And again, literally everything we did here from the displacement, right, displacement, uh, to the sesame seeds, to the materials, entirely procedural, okay? Uh, so at any point, I can go back to the geometry nodes. I could be like, okay, how many sesame seeds should there be? Uh, I mean, it looks kind of right, but maybe there should be a few more. I could either decrease the distance or bump up the density for that distance. I think we're going to have to decrease the distance in this case. And this is going to make it so some sesame seeds are close to each other, but again, not close enough uh, to be intersecting, Okay. Um, what else? Sesame seed, I feel like we could make it a bit darker, so let's just do that really quickly, I guess. Um, so I'm just gonna take this, I'm gonna darken it a tiny bit. Uh, we could also randomize this. I don't think it uses the same thing as particle info, I guess this will be a time to find out. No. So normally with, um, when you distribute it using particles, we have this. Otherwise, or what am I trying to say? I don't know what I'm trying to say is the point. Uh, when you distribute with particle info, with particles instead of geometry nodes, you get this random thing. Um, technically, I do believe there's a way to do this with geometry nodes, right? We have attributes here as well, uh, just like the other, but this part keeps being updated, so I'm not gonna mess around with it uh, too much. So like, I don't know which thing we, we would call, uh, but if you can call the right thing, we can see it. So like, I don't know, 
People have had some issues with this even on the Discord, so it doesn't seem to be working, but in theory, you type in one of the attributes from before, you pick the right one of these, and then it should show up, and then you can, you know, randomize it. Um, but, um, but um, I don't think I'm gonna vary the randomness here. Uh, there's probably a way to do it using like texture coordinates from Instancer, uh, but this ain't the time to do it freeballing. But maybe I'll go back to that on a uh, future tutorial. Anyways, uh, probably the longest bun tutorial anybody's ever seen, but also the most useful, question mark? I don't know. I mean, probably nobody talked about how to do it procedurally. So anyways, procedural, procedural using the MNB standard matter of the people are 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 the I'll be honest with you, I really have no idea what's going on over at the Discord server, but they're going crazy over there. They want the meat, and as a wise man once told me again, uh, I'm willing to give you that meat. So, uh, we're continuing the hamburger. Last time we made buns, this time I'm going to show you how to make the meat so the uh, Discord server doesn't like... I, I feel like it's getting crazy over there. It's actually scary, and I don't want to uh, weaponize them, so... The best to fuse them now. Uh, point is, we're gonna be making a, a patty, like the meat patty, and I'm also gonna show you a cool method uh, for draping cheese over this uh, without like modeling or anything like that. We're gonna use simulation. So anyways, uh, buns, we've made them, we're continuing. Uh, if you haven't seen the first tutorial, I mean, you don't need to. I mean, this is kind of independent, but whatever. Um, let, me, let me delete the ground point, we don't need it. So uh, to make uh, meat, I guess we're gonna use the same method as before. So I'm just gonna put this right here. We're gonna do some modeling again, since pretty much everything here is cylindrical um, in the sense that it's rotationally symmetric. You wanna start off with a cylinder. Now ideally you probably like subdivide it a bit more than I did, uh, but it's too late now and there's no going back unless you're Hermione uh, with the time turner. And uh, that is a game breaking or a book breaking mechanic if you think about it. Either way, uh, take a bun, uh, model it roughly to the size and proportions that it should be. Loop cut, this is basically the same thing as uh, before. I'm basically gonna do basic modeling and the rest of this is gonna be modifiers, okay? So with the meat patty, we're gonna add in a subdivision surface. Why? Uh, because we wanna do smoothing and to get rid of these artifacts, uh, which we do want to get rid of. Again, you want to inset the top and bottom because that's where the poles are. And there is an argument for saying that, you know, this doesn't really matter because it's going to be in between the buns and you can't see it anyways, but probably worth doing, especially if we want to do an animation, which I do at some point. <laughs> um, okay, boom, geometry. Maybe add one more loop here, one more loop here, and we're golden, okay? We have a patty. Um, just like the other uh, pieces of this uh, burger, I want to make all of this as procedural and as you know chaotic and random and no as and bleh, <laughs> as noise based as possible, right? Uh, to do this, I'm gonna take the patty. Same thing as last time, right? We're gonna do a displace modifier. Why? Uh, because this is a great way to add in some procedural noise for free. Again, the order of this matters. This is not the same as this. First, we're gonna add in geometry with the subsurf. Then we're gonna add in displacement, okay? Uh, for this, we're gonna use a new texture. So we already have a texture for the bun distortion, which is kind of this very light one. Uh, but for this one, we need a kind of crinkly, very dense, bubbly uh, distortion. I played around with some of these. It seems like Musgrave is kind of the option that you wanna be using. So Musgrave, uh, turn down the strength to something that's not insane. So again, this is the strength of that uh, texture. Um, and then we're just gonna play around with some settings. So size is gonna be kind of the scale of this pattern. In this case, we want a lot of detail, which it's kind of like an inverse relationship. We want the image to be small, very tiny, so we get more variation, more dots here. So you can see now we're getting more crinkles, maybe not as many, there we go. Um, and additionally, uh, th these have different sliders and then the cloud uh, texture. There's dimension, which definitely means something. I don't know what it means. <laughs> and there's also lucanarity, which just reminds me of that Avatar episode with Sokka and the moon, because I guess Luna kind of sounds like Luku, <laughs> Laku. I don't know. Uh, you could play around with some of these. Uh, generally, I think I'm okay with that. So uh, maybe, maybe what we want to do is subdivide once. Nah. Subdivide twice, then displace, and then either subdivide again or smooth, uh, just so it doesn't look as intense. And with smoothing, you just add in more iterations to make it look better. Uh, what I'm thinking is, uh, should we do should we do a subsurf? It's getting a bit computationally expensive to do it this way, but it seems like it's worth it. Okay, so we're gonna add in another subsurf after this again. Uh, the order of operations matters. I'll stop saying that at some point, probably never. Um, 
there we go, we have a meat patty. And again, the nice thing about this is we can control it procedurally at any point. So we might even end up modifying it um, in a second. Okay, uh, meat patty, how do we make it look, you know, like it's uh, made of meat? Uh, that's gonna be the material. So uh, we're gonna select our patty, which I'm just gonna rename to patty, boom, and uh, create a material and call this one patty, but spell it this way, like a name. Um, okay, for the base color, I'm gonna make it, you know, the color of meat. A great way to do this E for sample or not sample for extract or eyedropper. Uh, you just sample a color of this meat. I guess you want to pick like the average kind of orangey one. Wow, that looks horrible. We'll fix it. Um, we can do a bit of modification to the color here just so it looks a bit more burnt. And uh, just like all these other, you know, things, what's going to make it end up looking real is the uh, normal mapping and the uh, shininess and color variation and stuff like this. Um, so starting off with the uh, normal, I think that's going to be a good place to start. Uh, noise texture, probably a good way to start. This is just to add in some variation, and I'm going to use object coordinates. By the way, the reason there's a, this distortion, I don't know if you can tell, but the generated coordinates are kind of stretched along here. Um, it's because the bounding box has been kind of pinched because we kind of like scaled down this object. We might be able to fix that by doing like a control A, like rotation and scale. Yeah, that seems to fix it. Uh, basically, you need to update the bounding box. Um, if you don't want to mess with this, object coordinates are the way to go, and that's why I uh, did it, because object coordinates just kind of look at the origin, and that's it. doesn't really care about the bounding box. Uh, for this, uh, what do I want to use this for? I want to use this to add in some variation, kind of like a rocky surface. And I know it's meat, uh, but meat can be rocky too. It kind of looks like some kind of alien planet, where if you step on something, it just smells like old cow meat, right? Um, so for that, noise with high detail, with high roughness, we're going to take this, convert it into normal mapping again. Uh, this bump node is used to convert height information, so uh, black and white information, height information into normal information. If we plug this in here, we look at what it looks like, and now it kind of looks, you know, it looks more meaty, definitely not great, uh, but it's in the right direction. So. Let's make it half as strong. Okay, so this is uh, without the normal mapping, this is with. It's kind of important. <laughs> it's kind of a big deal to making this look realistic. And we can mess around with the uh, scale and stuff like this, see what looks kind of correct. I think we'll stick with five for now. Okay, uh, cool. Uh, how else do we make it look like meat? Well, uh, first of all, there's variation in color. And second of all, kind of in the same areas. Uh, for reasons that make sense, there's variation in shininess. Kind of like the areas that aren't exposed. Uh, should be shiny because I guess the oil doesn't come off of it, whatever. Uh, point is, we're just going to use, yet again, another noise texture to control this. And we might end up using the same one, but for now I'm going to experiment using a different one. So, uh, four-dimensional, give it a different seed value. This is just a three-dimensional cross-section of a four-dimensional noise. Don't worry about it. This W slider just ensures you get a different noise every time is what you need to take away from that. Uh, we're going to use this to, first of all, um, mess around with the color. So, mix RGB. Just like last time, control C, control V, just to sample the color. This is kind of the same thing we did to add some variation to the bun. So some areas are darker, brighter, yellower, browner, whatever. Uh, we're going to use this as a factor for multiplication against uh, black. Uh, why do I do this? Uh, the reason I do this is if you take a color and multiply it by black, in other words, the color or the vector 0, 0, 0, it darkens it. By how much? By this factor, right? So some areas are going to be multiplied more by black. They're going to get darker, and some areas are going to be less affected. They're going to be brighter. Um, and now we can actually, might might be easier to see what's going on if we pick a bright color. Maybe it's kind of hard to tell. We have this green color in some areas have variation. Um, but now we can kind of pick a hone in on a better kind of meat-like color. So something like this, maybe a bit oranger, redder. Definitely one of these. That kind of looks like meat. We can go back to that, though. Um, okay, so that's a good start. Uh, for roughness, again, how shiny this thing is. Wow, I feel, I feel like... I don't, I don't know if you guys just got this vibe. Sometimes I'll be talking and just realize I went on autopilot <laughs> for a second there. I'm like, did I, I... I don't know if I legitimately just stopped talking for 30 seconds or something. It's entirely possible. I feel like I just blanked out. Roughness, <laughs> that's what I was talking about, is how shiny a surface is. If, if we make it zero, you're going to see it super shiny. Uh, if we make it to one, it's going to be super rough. Um, one way to go about this is to just kind of keep it very shiny, um, and that's just a good way to kind of do this. Um, but since we want variation where some areas are shiny and some are not, we can always use this factor from here and uh, connect it to the roughness. And basically what this is saying is the same black and white noise is going to control uh, in the black areas where it's not rough and then the white areas where it's very rough, as in uh, very not shiny. 
Um, but for this one, we could do a bit of a modification since I want more of a, a visible uh, distinction between where it's shiny and not shiny. So I'm going to bring this up, and this is just going to make it uh, more high contrast. So before, after. And the way you want to think about this is these black areas that are super black are going to be super shiny. Um, however, if it's going a bit too far, you can take the minimum shine, <laughs> and I know we're getting a bit in the weeds here, uh, but you can take the lowest value could be, this black slider, roughness zero, and bump it up to something like 0.15. So even at its shiniest, it's only 0.15, nothing crazy. Okay? Um, second level variation, we want to uh, mix up the uh, color. So it shouldn't just be this uh, one shade. Uh, for this, we're going to be using mix, because we just want to mix two colors, not doing this multiply by black idea. Um, so we're going to do two colors. One of them is going to be that. The other color is going to be kind of like maybe a, a darker or brighter, I don't know, maybe a redder, brighter color. We can mess around with that in a second. Connect that here. And then let's try reusing this noise from before. I don't know if it will like technically make sense, but let's see what it gives us. Um, there is not very visible color variation here. We might need to bump up the contrast. By the way, um, if you don't like using a color ramp, just a quick trick. Uh, you can totally use a brightness and contrast node uh, to control this. However, um, it doesn't really, you know, give you as much fine control over stuff. Like, it does work. You can see now we have color variation. Um, but instead of just using a contrast slider, I like to have these two sliders. Uh, but now we have color variation, and then we multiply. So now you can see we have three things going on. Two, two colors plus one darkening. And that does add a good amount of variation. I do like that. Uh, there is a good question as to, like, what color it should be. Like, should it be super bright or should it be, like, super black? Maybe it should be super black. This actually makes it look cooked, uh, which is a great thing. I'm going to I'm gonna go with that. Uh, but, the, you know, it depends on if you want a medium rare. Or... By the way, just side tangent, people who order medium rare piss me off. I know it's the most common one, but I, I th in my mind, medium is what everybody wants. I think me people order medium rare because, you know, that's just what their dads ordered and then, you know. You follow suit, you never vary anything, so that's just, you know, how you live your life now. Just a thought. Um, okay, so we now have a very burnt, in a, in a good way, a well done, let's say, looking patty. This is kind of a different one. This is more like, I don't know, it almost looks like it's like seasoned and stuff like this. Uh, but this looks like a patty. This is good. Um, I do want to add in one more thing before we move on to the cheese, and this one's really useless, uh, but I do think it's fun. I want to add in, like, burn marks, like if, if it was grilled, like a bunch of lines. Um... We could do this procedurally, we could, like we could make a bunch of wave texture kind of things, or we could do this with texture paint, which is what I'm thinking about doing since, you know, we haven't really touched texture paint here, and I'm trying to go through all the areas of Blender in this tutorial, I suppose. Uh, so new image texture, we're going to call this like grill lines, and this will be a great way to show like the interplay between... Um, well, between what? Between procedural stuff and, like, you know, very uh, rasterized uh, textures. Uh, grill lines. Okay, we want to go to texture paint. Um, we're going to be painting grill lines. So we could actually just go to single image here and uh, load in grill lines. And the way you want to think about this is whatever we draw here is going to draw onto this grill lines image, uh, which we're then going to need to save. Um, but... What I'm thinking is we're just going to like draw some lines here. So to do that, uh, easiest way, stroke, change it to line. This makes it so you click, drag, and then it makes that line. Um, so I'm just going to make a couple. And I think you can hold control. No, it's alt. That'll make it like a straight line. I'm just going to make a couple of grill marks. We can even mess with this later procedurally. Uh, but this is just a good start. I guess we should also have it on the bottom, right? I feel like that just makes sense. So let's hide this. Go back to to what? To texture paint and do the same thing on the bottom. So alt, drag, alt, drag, alt, drag. You know, just another thought, <laughs> since, you know, I feel like a lot of this process is me just like doing a long thing and I feel like I need to fill in the dead air, right? Um, I've noticed in the past, especially when I used to do transcriptions a lot more for these tutorials, uh, there's a lot of reasons to say alt, right, uh, click, especially when you're doing motion tracking. And I was like looking back at these tutorials, I'm like, wow, I'm saying alt, right quite a bit <laughs> in these tutorials. Just a thing. I wonder if YouTube catches that in their little algorithm. Uh, grill lines. Uh, we have the image. What do we do? We save it. So alt, shift, s while hovering over here, or you could just go to like image, save as like a pleb. Alt, shift, s is the way to go. If you want to, you know, impress people. Grill lines, just save it out. 
um, on the desktop. Uh, the reason we do this, by the way, is if you close Blender and open it up again, uh, this texture will go back to blank, right? This white line stuff is going to be gone unless you save it, which is why we do it. Um, and then we could just load it in manually here. So the idea is uh, we have all this done. Perfect. Uh, for the image texture, I'm just going to reload this, even though it should be fine. So I'm just going to reload it, load it from the desktop. Um, and now we have this grill lines thing using the uh, UV map. Um, and now we could do literally whatever we want with this. We can use it to darken. We could even distort it, uh, stuff like this. So what's the idea? Uh, the idea is we want to do this like multiplication idea where it's getting darker, uh, but also incorporate these grill lines. Well, uh, whenever we're talking about incorporating, it's always an addition. So we want to take this noise. That's basically this black and white mask saying here, it should be dark here. It shouldn't, right? Multiplying by zero. Uh, we take this and then we add an influence from the grill line. And I think this is the correct way to think about this. So now we have these. Let's see if that gives us what we want. Yes, it does. Um, the alternative is it gives us like the exact uh, opposite. So here you, you can see what's going on here. Uh, it gives us the exact opposite uh, where, you know, you want to add in black, not white. Either way, I'm getting lost in the weeds. So cool. We've incorporated it. I'm thinking also, where did it go? Where did I just put that image texture? I've, uh, I've lost it already. It's because I'm on the wrong material. There we go. Um, I want to make it less intense since it's just kind of like dark black. Uh, so to fix this, um, just like usual, we're going to multiply uh, this side. So it's going to get to scaled. We're changing the strength uh, before we add or incorporate it. Uh, so again, if it's zero, invisible. If it's one, we have our lines. Let's do something like 0.5. I don't know. Half as strong. Should be good. Um, by the way, another thing, and this, this is a bit a bit much, I'll, I'll admit it, but I do think it's cool. Um, even if your texture paint is already locked in, like we did these like lines, right? We, we can't go back. Uh, we can still make them jagged, distorted lines without even repainting. Well, how do we do that? Um, it's actually the same uh, technique that we use to uh, blur between these two materials, make this like harsh. I mean, not harsh, kind of like wavy boundary. Um, so the idea behind this is right now, this is using UV coordinates intrinsically, like you don't even need to plug them in, but it, you know, it's as if UV coordinates were here. Uh, what you want to do is you want to take this, add in another noise and make the render even slower when we get there, but that's, you know, that's the price you pay. And we're going to mix this uh, with some noise it should work. So you mix these two together and just like last time you set this to linear lights and I gave a whole explanation about that. Uh, but the point is, uh, you can see here's our original thing. So linear light is zero. It's as if, you know, we're just using uh, UV coordinates. So again, we're distorting the coordinate system before we even get to the image. We're not changing this image. It's always going to be the same. But if we distort how it's mapped on the object, it's going to look like it's shifting, right? Uh, we take this, we increase the linear light, which is going to be how much noise, how much randomness is going to be incorporated. And you can see it adds in some variation. Not good variation, but it exists. Uh, to make it look good, we add in detail. This will just make it look sharper, a bit of roughness, and this will make it look more like charred lines. Um, and then we could play with the scale. The bigger the scale, the more like electric this looks like, and the smaller the scale, the more kind of like low frequency detail. Uh, so there's an argument for making it like this, kind of like charred lines, I'm thinking. So let's go to like 50 and play with the roughness, something like that. Um, and this is the before and after, right? So we're just messing with this. It also works on the bottom if we look at that button since it affects the whole image. Um, it's just a tiny thing to add in some realism and a lot of render time, but whatever. Um, if we ever do see the actual patty uh, where it's not covered with, you know, a bunch of stuff, then we'll appreciate that. Um, okay, okay, uh, moving on. I think we have a completed patty. Again, all this is procedural, since uh, especially the only thing that's kind of locked in is the texture paint we did, which is kind of dependent on the UV map, even though we added procedural stuff. Um, even though that's the only thing that's locked in, we can still mess around with displacement and stuff like this of the patty, and it will stick. It's kind of hard to tell, but it will stick onto this, because again, the UV map distorts uh, with it. Um, cool. So, you know, you can uh, move the buns, the patty, whatever. Uh, now let's make some cheese. And I, I told you, or I promised you a cool method uh, for this. And I do have one. So you're going to notice that uh, the cheese is kind of like draped over, uh, draped over the uh, patty. And then otherwise it just has like a yellow material. And, uh, you know, the normal approach for something like this is you just make a plane, you scale it up, you like add in a bunch of geometry just so we can edit it. And then what I've seen people doing 
um, is, you know, you just kind of do this proportional editing thing until it's like roughly in the right spot. Um, I recommend, since this is literally being draped over it, let's use physics. Makes sense. So I'm going to subdivide it just so we have more uh, geometry to work with. And then the core idea here is we're going to turn this into a cloth. If I can remember where it is, I think it's in physics, cloth. And then the thing that it falls on, let's go to solid mode, uh, the thing that it falls on should be a collision. So the cloth falls on our collision, and you can see it drapes over it. And then we can actually modify it after the fact, uh, which is the cool thing. So for example, um, the way you want to think about this cheese is the cloth is actually a modifier, so the simulation is actually just a step in this hierarchy. So afterwards, we can add in a solidify, in other words, thickness to the cheese, just like that. And the cool thing about this is, again, it's only simulating the initial thing. The uh, thickness is kind of an illusion, uh, but we get it for free. It's not like we're simulating something with thickness, right? So we do that, and then to the stack, we add something like a smooth or a subsurf, again, depending on what you want. Uh, but you, you just get that. And then if you move the cheese, you can get a different simulation. Now, of course, you do want to like hone this in a bit, like you want to change the cloth settings, like, I don't know, the, the cheesy settings, whatever makes it look more like it's melting than cloth uh, is a thing you can do. Um, however, um, I'm not going to mess around with it too much. I'm just kind of kind of going to kind of go with the default settings. So I'm just going to kind of dress our simulation. So to do this, I'm just going to like reposition our initial state of the cheese. So I'm making it smaller, still works, nothing changes. And I'm thinking what we can do is we can put one here, make a duplicate that is again going to inherit all the modifiers and everything. This one's going to be rotated, and then we can have one more piece of cheese. So this is like a triple cheese thing. We simulate all of these. And then uh, when we're happy with this, and you do, this is a part that we do actually have to bake in, so we do lose this proceduralism. Uh, so make sure you're happy with this. But once we are, you just apply all the modifiers, okay? So to do that, you want to go in order. You don't want to, like, apply subdivision and then that, because then it's going to mess it up, right? Uh, you want to first apply the cloth, so we've done the simulation, then the thickness, and then the subsurf, okay? In the order they're presented. So apply, apply, and control A is the shortcut to do that, by the way. And I'm going to do that for all three of these. So it is going to kind of like lock it into position, right? Like if we play now, there's no more uh, simulation, uh, but we don't need any more either, okay? Okay. Um, Final issue, we need to, you know, address this uh, overlapping, this intersection. Uh, yes, we could have avoided this by simulating one piece of cheese, making it static, then making it, it, or what am I trying to say? We simulate one at a time, each time making it a collision object after the fact. So now it's falling on a new mesh, etc. Uh, I didn't want to do that, so whatever. Uh, let me get rid of this collision as well. Um, so to fix this uh, super easily, uh, you just take proportional editing, right? Um, and this is going to make it so when we move one face, it moves a bunch of them. Uh, we're just going to do a bit of manual tweaking. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Why? Uh, because this is going to be covered with lettuce and stuff like that. But if we can avoid very obvious intersection, like the kind I'm seeing here, uh, that's always a good thing. And you can always, you know, take the object as a whole and like bring it up so it's definitely working and then bring back these sections so they're hovering back over the cheese and maybe that's a smarter way to think about this okay so this could be the first layer or maybe this should be the first layer this could be the second layer we bring it a bit up and then we take uh, this section of the cheese and bring it down or right there it really doesn't need to be perfect okay uh, let's make sure these are all shade smooth because these are gonna have to be shiny uh, so that's important and now let's see what we have. Okay, we have a burger with a couple of draped uh, planes. How do we make it look cool? Uh, well, we may, we give it a material again. Uh, this material is going to be the easiest one. So this is going to be our cheese material. Uh, what do we want in our cheese material? Well, it should be it should be the color of cheese. So again, eyedropper. Just pick the color of cheese that you want. I found that uh, when you kind of bake in these cloth simulations, uh, things don't tend to update. So you got to kind of move it, as you can see. Um, but then it updates. Uh, you take these other two, uh, shift click this one, and then control L uh, for link. Wow, there, there's some new things added. I don't think I've ever seen link fonts to text. Whatever, there's some new things here I need to look at. Either way, uh, copy modifiers. And that should work once we move it. Nope, not modifiers. I just had a brain fart. Um, you want to do the same thing, but instead of uh, modifiers, it's materials. I just saw an object or a thing that started with the letter M. I'm like, oh, it must be right. Uh, but now we have the cheese. By the way, I do want to see uh, what, what is new here. 
Link, all these seem to be here. And I think link fonts to text is new. Copy UV maps. Some of these, some of these seem new to me. Either way, uh, we have our material. Uh, it should be very shiny. Like you can see, you can see this cheese is like highly reflective. Not a mirror, but close. So like 0.2, something like that. So now you can see we're getting the specular. If we go down too low, it's a bit crazy. Like we can literally see the room we're inside. But maybe we could do like 0.125, kind of like a compromise. No, that's too much or too little rather. 0.2. Okay. We have cheese. Um, what else can we do to make uh, the cheese look good? Well, uh, right now, uh, since the uh, simulation's locked in, uh, we don't really have a very easy way to add in, you know, geometric variation. Like, yes, we can do the proportional editing thing, whatever. Um, but we can't add waviness to this cheese, as you can see. Uh, so we want to do that in a material. And like with all these things, the way to do it is with an with noises, but really with a uh, normal, uh, what am I trying to say? A normal map. So we take a noise texture. This one's gonna be very low frequency since we just want very kind of big scale waves. We take this, we add in bump again, converting this into normal information, connect this here. Let's see what that looks like. So that's way too intense, but you can see the idea. I'm gonna switch this over to object coordinates. And uh, the goal, again, is to make it look low frequency in all this. Uh, so for the first time, we're actually going to take detail and try to bring it down. And this is going to make it look less terrainy and a bit more smooth. So we do that. And then also the roughness you bring down. Because I think roughness uh, makes it look very jagged. So you want to bring roughness down and the scale down, just so it's kind of like low frequency detail. And you can see if we look at the noise, it's just kind of like big black blobs and stuff like this. Uh, but you can see here's the before. And here's the after. It just adds in a bit of variation for free. Uh, it makes it look wavy, even though it's not. Okay, uh, let's make it. Oh, by the way, <laughs> with that okay, somebody left the comment saying, saying I love the way he says, okay, <laughs> or like, okay. <laughs> so then apparently I do uh, just that. Uh, let's mess around with the color a bit more. I'm thinking it should be a bit brighter, maybe a bit more orange. Am I crazy for thinking that? Something like that. I'm, I'm trying to avoid the look of plastic and still air on the side of cheese, which is kind of hard because they look kind of similar. And that, you know, sometimes people call cheese plasticky. I'm thinking if we dip the saturation just a bit. Yeah, there we go. That will, or does it do the opposite? I think, I think that helps. Um, it makes it look more cheesy. If anything, I wish I could have gone back to the uh, solidify uh, modifier and made the uh, cheese a bit thinner, uh, but it's not the biggest deal in the world. So. There we go. Um, let's do a tiny bit of cheese variation. I think technically this is an incorrect way to go about it, but I'm gonna do it. So I'm gonna make a second cheese material. Cheesy too. Uh, this is basically the same thing, but I wanna change the color. So um, do I need to like move this again? Yeah. Uh, so I want some pieces of cheese to be a slightly different color, not green. That was just a test. Um, but like this one could be slightly, I don't know, more orange. It's not very visible but it exists. But now that I think about it, you know, technically this isn't correct because, you know, you just apply the same cheese a bunch of times, but I do think it adds a bit of something. So either way, uh, what have we done this tutorial? We made a very good looking patty. Let's hide this cheese. A very good looking patty with grill marks. It's procedural. You can change stuff. Uh, and then we melted some cheese on top. So now we have a good section of our burger. Um, and now we got to move on to bacon. Maybe we could do bacon, uh, but definitely vegetables and stuff like that as well, uh, which I think we're going to use different methods for, but I'm not quite sure yet. No matter how much we want to put it behind us, okay, there's always going to be that cringy time in our history where liking bacon was a personality trait. Like, oh, I'm so quirky. I'm so wild. I like bacon. And also that Reddit thing, oh, the bacon narwhal midnight thing. I seriously regret living through that cringy time period in retrospect. But anyways, uh, we're still on the burger thing. I know it's going to be like a 10 part fucking series, but just buckle up because that's just what, what, what it's gonna be. Um, and in this part, I just wanna talk about making the bacon. And you might think, oh, bacon's kinda easy. You just import in an image and do all this. I actually already have an image loaded in here. Uh, by the way, make sure you go to Google Images and just download a piece of bacon um, with, with an alpha channel that's gonna be useful. Um, you, you think it would be easy. However, uh, this actually presents a major challenge, which is why I'm isolating it into its own tutorial. So uh, without further ado, let the cringy bacon memories uh, 
you know, continue. 2009 is making a comeback and it's scary in more ways than one. So uh, how do we do this? Well, first of all, we're gonna add in a plane. Uh, you can also do this with import images as planes add on. I'm not gonna do it that way though, uh, because I don't know. I, I just wanna do it the slow way. Import in a plane, we're gonna make a material. And basically uh, this material is where we're gonna make it look like bacon, right? So uh, take your bacon image, whichever one you downloaded, we're gonna import it in here. And then as you probably expect, all we need to do is, you know, this is already a bacon texture, which for some reason we need to move to update. You take the color, you plug it into the base color, it's visible. However, we don't want uh, the background to be invisible, or no, we do <laughs> we do want it to be invisible. Forget what I just said, right? Um, and luckily we have an alpha channel to do that. So you just plug this in to the alpha sockets, okay? Uh, when we view this BSDF, we now have a piece of bacon, it's great, it's whatever. We can like uh, subdivide it a couple times to like, you know, morph the geometry and stuff like that. Um, all this is good, however, However, uh, we do want this to have thickness, and this is where the issue comes in, because um, if I was to go to like the modifiers, or just do it manually, but if I was to go to the modifiers, give it a solidify modifier, right, this is what we do to add thickness, you're gonna see, wow, um, it kind of just projects two pieces of bacon without any thickness in between, and that is what this tutorial is about, how do we add in thickness? Well, um, one thing you might think is, oh, go, w go through this like with the knife tool and like cut around this and then extrude it. Uh, you could, but there's too much detail on the border, so that takes too much time. Oh, we could do this with a vertex uh, map and then, you know, put this as a vertex group. Uh, that's also possible, but also uh, very hard to do. So, uh, what is the solution uh, to this? How do we give it thickness? Well, um, what a lot of people do is they seem to stack a bunch of planes and then render it in Eevee. So instead of just two, they have like 50 planes and it looks pretty good unless you look at it exactly from the side uh, where it becomes invisible. Uh, so what we're gonna do instead is we are gonna use a volume. And yes, this is a very janky solution, but it, it does work. So principled, vo yeah, principled volume, we're gonna hook this up here. So yes, the material can have both a surface. So imagine that this is a cube now with the solidify, uh, both the surface, right, which is the bacon and a volume, uh, which is the white stuff, right? Um, and what we need to do is make this volume look uh, correct, right? It should only be under the bacon and it all should also be the color of the bacon, okay? Um, so first thing we'd want to do is we'd want to like bump up the density uh, just so it looks more solid. Of course, we don't want this everywhere. So we use the uh, alpha channel from before as the density. We actually don't need this attribute. And by the way, this works for any two-dimensional image with a uh, alpha channel. It's kind of universal. Uh, we're going to multiply this by something like 100. Um, and you're going to notice it doesn't work. And this is the first big frustration. I spent a long time trying to fix this. Uh, because we have an alpha channel, we're making sure it's very intense. Why is that not showing up in the density, right? Um, the reason is... Um, <laughs> the reason is once we do the solidify modifier, right, this is a basically a three-dimensional volume and the image texture, which we're using even just for the alpha, right, it's using UV coordinates, which are only two-dimensional, which means we need to use a three-dimensional coordinate system, namely generated coordinates, which by the way, they're exactly the same as UV coordinates in this case of a plane, uh, but they also have that Z component. So you can see now this is actually working. So, right, UV gives us nothing, generated gives us that thickness. So the way you want to think about it, is um, the, I guess we want to not look at the uh, surface. The alpha with the generated coordinates is basically a three-dimensional volume outlining the bacon, okay? That's the idea, okay? Uh, so now we have a volume that's thick in the right place, but it doesn't look uh, correct. So first of all, we can take the color from the texture. Yes, we can use a, a three-dimensional uh, situation now because we use uh, generated coordinates. You can take this, put it right here, and then it does pretty much what you expect, right? It stretches the color uh, from the rim downwards, right? It's not perfect, but it does look uh, pretty okay, okay? Um, other things we can do to this, well, you're gonna notice it does look a bit jagged, a bit weird. Uh, this is mainly because our image texture is like low resolution, but a couple things. First of all, we're gonna take the density and bring it up just so it really looks solid and not like a volume. And second of all, in the render settings, if you go to volume, which I can never find, there it is. Uh, these two numbers are basically saying what quality or really what step size, or like it, what, what level of precision is what step size means uh, should we render our volumes with. We have one for the viewport and one for the render. Well, for the viewport, just so we can see, we can bring this down and you can see we start getting these bands, uh, which means we are getting more and more precise, right? Um, and you could basically like lower both of these numbers for viewport and render, uh, but I'm not gonna touch that because that is gonna make the render times take forever. So uh, what do we have so far? Right now, what we have is a procedural system 
this is still procedural, where we can change the thickness of the bacon at any time. And yes, we need to lower our step size if we make it too thick, obviously. Uh, but luckily, we have the advantage of this being a thin object. So I'm going to make a thin piece of bacon. Additionally, even though we're using a solidify modifier in this whole volume generated coordinate situation, right? Um, this does not stop us from selecting an area with proportional editing, right? Um, and like raising it. And I guess we want it to be bigger. Uh, the generated coordinates stretch with this deformation because the solidify is applied after. There, there's a whole methodology to this. Uh, but the point is this is a thickness giving... <laughs> what a weird way to talk about that. This is a thickness giving uh, technique that moves with the uh, deformation, okay? Um, so what, other, what else do we want to do for this uh, bacon material, which I guess we should rename before we apply to our burger? Uh, well, first of all, it's still, even though it's three-dimensional, now it's kind of like a three-dimensional kind of flat image. Uh, we want to give this normal mapping, some shininess, basically what we've been doing for the rest of this. So uh, same tricks as last time. We're going to use the color. Again, That even though this is just a surface property, we only want to see this on the surface anyways. We're going to take the color, use the bump node to convert height information, factor information into normal information, uh, which again, doesn't really work in the uh, volume section of this, the rim, but it doesn't matter since it's so thin. Uh, you can see now we've given it some normal mapping. It's what's going to make it look a bit crisper. Crisper is a biological technology, which stock has been going up quite a bit. For the people who care. Um, I guess we want the strength to be lower. I remember learning about CRISPR in biology. I didn't understand it was something you could invest in. Very strange world we live in. Um, additionally, I want shininess because bacon has grease. And I found, and this might not be technically correct, but I think it makes sense, right? The darker the images, images, you know, the more burnt a section of bacon is, the less shiny it should be, right? Because then all the oil, the bacon grease would have gone on, gone off. Uh, but the brighter the part of the image is, it means it's less, less cooked, it's more fatty, there's more oil. Uh, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say we can use a color ramp, a color ramp filter through here, um, and we can make a mask based on this idea where the brighter parts should be shinier. Well, shinier means lower roughness, so I actually want to invert this just to begin with. So again, uh, the dark areas are now going to be white, where white is going to represent, and again, we do have the boundary, but it doesn't matter since we have the alpha channel. It doesn't matter. Um, the boundary, what, what, what the fuck am I trying to say? Uh, the dark parts have now been mapped to white, which should have a high roughness, and again, the uh, you know, the bright parts, which we've mapped to black, should be shiny. Um, and we don't want, like, the black areas, like the shiniest parts, to literally be perfectly reflective. Let's keep it at, like, 0.3 or something and see what that looks like. So we take the color, plug it into roughness. So, yes, we're using our image here not only for color, but also for normal mapping, for roughness to generate this volume. You can get quite a bit of information out of a single image. But you can kind of see that uh, these bright areas of the image should be a bit shinier, more reflective than the others. This becomes more obvious when we turn down the normal mapping. They reflect by different amounts. And we can even we can even make this a bit more intense, something like 0.15, just so it's really reflecting. Okay, I like the look of that. Let's bring back some of that normal mapping, and we can always change this later. Um, now that we have our bacon piece, we can start duplicating and making copies and all that. So uh, top view, we're going to position it inside the burger. And, you know, above the cheese. I think technically you put, maybe you put the the bacon under the cheese. I cannot for the life of me remember. But it's definitely one of those things. So normally, what's going to make this look realistic is the placement of it. Um, normally bacon isn't like perfectly centered. Like you have a piece kind of coming out of only one side you find. Um, so we're going to do that kind of positioning. We can have it curl up a bit. Whoops. Curl up a bit. Go up here, down here. Again, a lot of this only matters if we actually open up uh, the burger, which right now it is open, but eventually we're going to put like lettuce and tomatoes and all this stuff over it. Uh, you just want to make it look a bit random and chaotic and not like a flat piece of whatever. Flat piece of poop. There we go. Piece of bacon. You take it. You duplicate it. Again, it's going to have the whole material set up um, and the solidify modifier, so it should just work right off the bat. This version, I just want to like rotate a bit and have it sticking out a different side. So the first one was sticking out over here. So maybe this one, we could have it sticking out over here, I guess. I don't know. I guess it's always best to, I mean, this would, this reference doesn't have bacon. So we, I was going to say it's best to work from reference, but our reference ain't working. By the way, it might be advantageous to work from look dev mode just for the positioning of this. No, we can't see the volume or anything, but... Um, we can kind of imagine what it's going to look like. So this is just for uh, speeding up 
this whole process. It's, it is trying to render the volumes. By the way, if you don't know what look dev mode is technically, I'm pretty sure it's just like a weird instance of Eevee, uh, which is why the volumes are behaving very weirdly. Like we haven't defined uh, alpha, like our material uh, doesn't have any transparency in Eevee at least. Um, just position the bacon is, is the point. And we could have some pieces be slightly bigger or smaller than others. I'm thinking maybe one more piece of bacon. So I'm just going to duplicate the first one. And then we are going to rotate it and position it. I don't know. I mean, ideally, we don't want these intersecting. But like, come on, dude. Does it matter? Maybe not. So this bacon, I want to lower. And maybe lower it here as well. Up here. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, that looks pretty good. Um, and again, this is no matter what you do, um, this is pretty much going to look realistic right off the bat because we are just using like an image texture. We're not uh, doing the materials for this one procedurally unless you count the volume uh, intentionally because bacon's one of those things that's kind of hard to make look uh, correct. Um, one more thing uh, we can do just to add in a tiny bit of uh, variation, uh, which I think uh, should help. I want different pieces of bacon to have different uh, levels of uh, brightness. Uh, so right now, all these bacon pieces all share this material, right? We have three, yeah, number of users. We have three users of this material. Uh, what I want to do, let me just move this out of the way. I want to take the color that is going to the base color, right? We have a lot of stuff coming out of the socket. I just care about this one. We want to take Q saturation value, or basically any node that's going to modify it. So the value is just going to darken the bacon. As you can see, we can have very black bacon or whatever. Uh, what I want to do is change this number for different pieces. How do we do that? With object info. Object info has a random socket, is the idea. And the random socket is going to give us a different number between 0 and 1 for every user, every piece of bacon of this material. Okay. Um, so you could just like take the random and plug this in right here as the value, although we do run the risk of some pieces of the bacon being, you know, a bit too dark. Um, so quick fix for this, and I know we're getting really in the weeds here. Like really the core idea of this tutorial was how do you give a flat image thickness? Uh, now you know. Uh, but let's get in the weed. We're already here. Okay, Let, let's get all through the weeds. Uh, random goes through 0 to 1. I'm going to map range it. So instead of going from 0 to 1, I want to say, I don't want it to be that dark. So maybe at the worst, it could be like 0.5 or something like that. Um, so there's still going to be variation. You can still see there's a bit of variation. Uh, but now it's not as intense as it was before. So it's lifting anything that was uh, below 0, right? And now uh, let's see what that looks like. Okay, cool. And really, you could reposition this bacon. You could add in more make it smaller or whatever. Um, but, you know, that's the essence of it. I think for the tomatoes and the lettuce and all this, once we get to it, I don't know if we're going to use the same method for the lettuce. I'm going to see if I can come up with something a bit different. Like maybe we could do this one procedurally. But for now, I just want you to know that this method exists. It's interesting. I found it on a forum post. And uh, yeah. So as much as it does pain me to say it, all tutorial series actually do have to end like a line segment. This is the end of the line, the last bite of the hamburger. So uh, in this part four, we're going to be making the vegetables, mainly being, I guess, a tomato and lettuce. You could also use these techniques for pickles or whatever else. I got to be very careful to not swear in this tutorial, by the way, because we're actually sponsored. Yay, we did it. Um, so we got to keep this one clean, uh, which I struggle with a little bit, <laughs> but I'm going to do my best. So uh, what's the point? The point is in the last three parts, we made the bun, we made the meat with the cheese, we made the bacon, which was actually its own little uh, challenge right there. And we're going to use all these techniques to now model the rest of this. So uh, what you're going to need for this final part is a picture of a tomato, which I already loaded. But my little ape brain was like, oh, yes, let's forget about that. <laughs> uh, tomato image. Make sure you have one and also lettuce, lettuce image. And uh, the reason we have both of these is uh, who has time to make it procedurally? You know, we, we have images. We can make it super fast. So uh, once we have that, uh, I guess we can begin. So uh, let's start. God, I read another comment. I know I say I don't read comments, but sometimes it gets to me. I'll, I'll go down to the comment section and start reading. Somebody said it's not only okay, right? I say okay all the time. I also say so in the middle of every sentence. So, oh, just did it. I have no control over it. So, uh, let's make a tomato. I've already added in a plane. We're going to use basically the same technique as the bacon, but a bit modified. So, for this one, uh, tom <coughs> tomato texture, well, 
I would not recommend eating cookies right before this. The crumbs get in your throat, and then you start feeling crummy. And then, you know, that's really it. Um, color, make sure it's connected to base color, and I guess we don't have an alpha channel. Um, and for this one, we're literally just going to cut out uh, with the knife tool instead of doing what we did last time with the volumetrics and all this. Uh, we might end up doing that for the lettuce, though. So uh, once you have this thing, you just click K, you start outlining this. And I know what you're thinking. Why didn't you just add in a circle instead of a plane, and then you can reposition the vertices? And that's a good point. But... Uh, then you should be making the tutorials, not me. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, the reason you don't do that is because then you have to do these vertex sliding uh, maneuvers that then move the UVs, uh, which ends up, you know, making it so that you have two steps. You have to do that, and then you have to remodify this, like, project from view UVs. So uh, that's why I use the knife tool. It's easy. We're basically cutting out a circle. Uh, the finer you do this, the better. However, uh, I'm just going to do it with, like, I don't know, 30 segments or something like this. So select the face, control I to invert and delete faces. So now we just have this. And by the way, if it's looking super weird here, just remember there's volumetrics. And I also want to uh, mention that if you're getting weird uh, shadows and stuff like this, which we're not, but in case you are, uh, you want to go, because I didn't mention this last tutorial, go to light paths and take your transparency passes up. So uh, if they're too low, you're going to see that there's some weird stuff, some weird S-H-I-T. It rhymes with the dip. No, it doesn't. It rhymes with clip. It's kind of hard to find something it rhymes with when you're going on the fly. Either way, make your transparency passes higher because then it fixes the uh, volumetrics, which look weird otherwise. Okay, uh, tomato, we, we've uh, done this texture thing. Great, uh, you want to select everything. E for extrude and give it the thickness of a tomato slice. And uh, we are going to fix the rim. I know it's supposed to be one color, especially if you look at this. This is like a bright red kind of thing. I mean, this is set dressed right? This isn't realistic. These aren't realistic beauty standards for tomatoes, uh, <clears throat> but it should just be one color relatively. So if you ever look at the outside of a tomato, you already know that. Um, okay, so we have this. Uh, let's make it look a bit better. couple things, first of all, and you could have done this with a solidify modifier, but I'm just baking it in. Um, I guess we should do this in solid mode. Uh, I'm selecting the top and bottom faces, I for insets, bring it as much in as possible. Uh, one thing you're going to notice with the knife tool is it does create these weird artifacts. Uh, there are a way, there are ways to get around this, uh, so you can pinch it like really uh, thin, um, but uh, it really doesn't matter for this, right? So just get it as close as you can. <coughs> wow, those cookies, dude, those cookies. Uh, the reason we're adding in geometry, by the way, um, is because since the UV is already baked in um, at any point, and, it, and we are getting this weird kind of effect where we can't see what's going on with the uh, faces. It's weird. Uh, but the point is, you can select the face with proportional editing enabled, uh, move like chunks of this, and then the uh, tomato um, is going to move with that uh, deformation. Um, so this is just a good way to make this look more organic, pun intended, haha. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> how else can we make this look real? Well, it's the usual tricks you should already be used to at this point, like actually giving your materials a good name. So you say tomato, I say give it a material, <laughs> tomato. Uh, take this, connect it to height. Again, the reason we do this is to create normal mapping for free. So let's just plug that in right there. Um, it's going to look a bit uh, too bumpy, but it does give it a bit of dimension. So before, after, this one we're going to make very, very small the strength because um, tomatoes are very glossy. What makes them look realistic is the fact that they're watery, and especially in some areas here, there's, they're more shiny. In fact, they're a bit transmissive, but we're probably going to skip over that. So uh, to get that roughness idea, I think we've already talked th about this before, we can still extract more information from this image. So for example... In this image, um, it just so happens, I think, <clears throat> it's not exactly true, or maybe it's the opposite of what I'm thinking. Um, basically, the color determines how shiny it is. So is it that the red areas are the shiniest, and then the white areas are kind of like the rind, they're not shiny at all, or is it the opposite? I'm not quite sure, but whatever. Either way, use a color ramp. This is a good way to isolate sections of it, so we can isolate uh, what is the white area. So again, this is, uh, you know, these areas right here are being isolated. And then, like, as for which parts are shinier, that's up to you. I think, and I could be wrong, and if I'm wrong, do the opposite. It seems like the red is supposed to be the shinier part. So, in other words, uh, what we have as white right now uh, should be, it should be white. It should be a very large value. 
you know, relatively, so that it's a roughness, very high in roughness. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? What I'm trying to say is the white area, this thing we've isolated, should be very rough, not very shiny, and what the black area is, again, the area that has very low roughness, uh, we can set it to something close to zero, maybe not exactly, but like 0.1, just so it's not like literally a mirror. Um, and then we connect this to the roughness, and then we have a nice little approximation of which areas should be shiny. Cool. And again, uh, we, we addressed this before. By we, I mean me. You know, yeah, you have no part in this. You're just the viewer. Um, I don't know why that made me think of 1984. Am I a big brother? No, I'm a good guy. Um, <laughs> we already talked about this, but the rim is a bit, it's a bit, uh, it rhymes with duct. <laughs> and uh, the issue is we have the normal mapping distorting it, and the color is sh supposed to be one color. So to fix this, uh, let's just make a second material. There's fancy ways to do this, but this is probably the cleanest. So uh, we're going to add in a second material slot so one object can have multiple materials. And this one is going to have a second uh, tomato material, which we can call tomato rim. Okay? Uh, so right now, this isn't affecting anything, right? Because everything is assigned to the tomato material. We want some of it to have the rim. And to do that, you just select the faces that you care about. You click assign. And now this has the tomato rim material. Well, what are we going to do differently about this one? Well, uh, one thing we can do... It's probably just to get rid of all this. Anything that depends on the image, we don't care about. So I'm just going to get rid of it. And now you can really see it's isolated. Uh, for the base color, I'm just going to, and maybe it's best to do this in look dev mode, um, just so we get a little less shine and stuff like this. I'm just going to sample E for eyedropper or for uh, my brain. My brain's just going to places I should not be talking about. Um, we can kind of sample a color and then kind of hone it in. Uh, to what we want, messing around with the vibrance, the hue, stuff like this. And let's see that in rendered mode. That looks pretty good. Uh, we can have this have its own custom roughness, so I, I guess it should be pretty shiny, something like 0.2. Um, and we can mess with normals and stuff like this, but I think it's fine. So shade smooth. Um, well, I guess that's the best we're going to get out of shade smooth. This is one reason uh, the knife tool does suck. Although you, you could do a subdivision surface and all this, but Okay, we have a tomato. We can modify it with proportional editing and all this, but let's not get carried away. Let's just put it inside our burger. So position it up here, move it up. By the way, I just click H on the um, on the bun just to hide it. Um, and how big are tomato slices? I guess they're thicker for one. Uh, so let's see if we can do that. We select the center, control plus a couple times. This just expands our selection. That's a little trick. And then without proportional editing this time, we make it a bit of a thicker tomato. Yes, that is nice. It really looks realistic, and of course it should, uh, because we just referenced, uh, you know, existing textures. I'm just going to make this a bit rougher. I'm noticing it's a little too reflective. Um, what was the point? The point is we need a set dress. So I'm just going to set one here, uh, where we can duplicate this one, position it, I don't know, somewhere here. And again, uh, this is a good time to actually whip out proportional editing. Whip it out. Open your pants and whip out that proportional editing. Uh, because now we can actually layer tomatoes on top of each other. And yes, you could do the kind of cloth simulation cheese idea that I was talking about before, that we did before. Uh, but it just, yeah, there, there's no point. There really isn't. Especially for something like this. Like for, for this one, we'd want it to be way over, but I'm just going to dip the tomato under as if there's like room for that, even though there isn't. And let's add, I mean, this is a, a generous hamburger. You're never going to get this many tomato slices at this ripeness and size. Uh, but whatever, let's just say that this is a good burger. I'm just going to rotate some of these slices, uh, make it look a bit varied. This one could be a bit rotated. Bring that down. And okay, we have tomatoes. Um, again, uh, different burgers will look uh, different. You just want to set dress this um, until it looks like the burger that you want. So let's do Alt-H, and now we have that back in. Uh, finally, lettuce. Uh, we're going to do kind of a hybrid method. This one I've been experimenting around with where half the time it looks good, and half the time it just looks awful. It just doesn't look like a hamburger. So I wonder which one we'll get now. So again, plain material. This is going to be a lettuce make a material material. Let's load in the image. So uh, for this, we're going to use the hybrid of the bacon technique, because again, this is an image with an alpha channel. What do I mean? Uh, what I mean is we connect base color, we connect alpha, we update it for some reason. It needs that. And you can see we have this transparent thing. Again, the issue with this is no matter what we do to this, whatever kind of uh, deformation or whatever, at the end, we want to give it thickness. So we do the solidify modifier. But again, there's nothing in between, right? Uh, which is why we need to execute uh, order 60s. I forget. The, the trick to begin with. Um, but before we get to that, let's make it look a bit more like lettuce. So what I'm thinking is, 
And this is a, just a technique I've been playing around with. Uh, what we do is we're going to subdivide this a couple times. And the uh, trick here is you don't want to subdivide it too much because the method I'm about to show you, um, it benefits from not having that much detail. So maybe one more round, maybe. Um, the method is we're going to use proportional editing, but this time for the type of a fall off, we're going to use random. Basically what this does is it's proportional editing, but every vertex within the area um, is displaced by a random number between 0 and 1, or like a strength value of 0 or 1, something like that. Uh, which is going to give it this very, I mean, I know what you're thinking, you, you are messing this up, but it's a variation that's actually going to be useful because when we apply stuff we want of these, I guess you could do subsurf, that smooths it out. Another way to think about this is you could do it with uh, smoothing. The point is, uh, this is a nice way to add in variation, which we can then smooth out. And again, we can always like take this down a bit. So I'm just scaling on the Z axis. Uh, um, what's the point? Uh, it smooths it out. And if we look through the material view, um, it keeps the transparency where it's supposed to, but it makes it look like there's crinkling in the leaves. Why do we do this? Because there's supposed to be that there. Now, in reality, it's supposed to be much more extreme than this, right? Uh, but this is just like a demo scene, and we can actually make it look pretty good. And different hamburgers have different kinds of lettuce. That's another thing to think about. So uh, once we have this, now we need to think about hierarchy again. So first we're smoothing, then we want to add in a bit of thickness. So again, we're doing the solidify, which does have the issue from before, but we're going to fix it. Um, if you recall, the solution is adding in a volume in between, and we do a special little expression to say where we do and don't want, wow, well, we're not on full screen, uh, where we do and do not want volume. So I'm going to add in volume. Let's get rid of the density. We need it to be a, be a higher density so we can actually see it. And you can see the volume actually deforms with the surface, right? Uh, which in this case is useful since we need the area in between the leaves to move with it. You get the point. Um, we need the density to only exist in between the lettuce solidify leaves, right? Uh, the way we thought about doing this is if you take an alpha, connect it to the density, which right now is 0 to 1, so you multiply it by like a big number. Point is, I just want the density to be huge where it's supposed to be. So here's the alpha channel, and then we want it to be huge uh, where the volume's supposed to be. Uh, but remember, this doesn't work. It doesn't show any volume because, why is it? Pop quiz, do you remember? It's because this uh, image texture, which has the alpha inside of it, is using UV coordinates, right? If we actually show its coordinate system, it's using this two-dimensional U and V, X and Y coordinate system. Instead, we need basically that, but with a Z axis, and that's what generated is going to give us. Um, and this only works for planes and very specific scenarios. But point is, now we have the alpha with thickness where it's supposed to be. So I'm just going to make that times a thousand, just so it's hyper thick. And when we view it like that in the volume, and then we put a surface on top of it, you can see we filled in the area. With which color? With the color of the texture. And that will, uh, you know, it might generate a couple issues, but it, you know it doesn't look uh, too bad, especially if you go to uh, the transparency passes and bring those up, especially for this one. If you do not do it, so I'm going to go back to low passes, it's going to mess stuff up. If you look at the wrong angle, you can see there's some like black and stuff over here that should be fixed when we, whoops, not that one, uh, when we bring up transparency, you see it goes away. Okay, uh, so what do we want to do with this? So again, uh, I mean, I guess there's you know what, before we add it in, just let's do the usual, just a bit of dressing, right? So, God, that's another pun. There is a dressing. Well, it's not dressing. It's like condiments on a hamburger. Uh, color, we connect it to height Y to get free normal mapping. This is just free detail that will make it look real, maybe at half the strength. And then for the reflection, I mean, if it's washed lettuce, I guess it should be pretty shiny. And, you know, we could go with the methodology that some areas should have different roughnesses than others, but whatever. Um, well, what were we talking about? Set dressing, set dressing. So I'm going to position this here. Now, this part's a bit harder to make look good because we are going to need to do a second pass of proportional editing and lettuce should be like sticking out in certain areas and not others. Uh, but we can always reference our image. So I'm just going to take our lettuce, duplicate it, rotate it. Again, it's going to inherit our whole volume uh, situation that we made for it. Okay, so right now it's not looking too hot, but don't worry, we're going to fix it, and then we're going to render it and have a good time. Okay, so that, that that's a good start. Um, just to make it look a bit more realistic, a couple things that I would recommend. One, have it stick out in some areas more than others, like, uh, you know, it wasn't a you know, properly made burger, which is actually realistic because most of them aren't. Um, another thing, proportional editing, this time set to smooth, so don't we don't get the randomness, right? Uh, this is used to, you know, 
do an overall positioning of our lettuce, just like we did with the bacon and the tomatoes. And again, uh, because we have a hierarchy of modifiers, the solidify moves with it. So I'm just going to position some lettuce down, uh, some of it up. I don't know. I mean, there there is an argument to, and I'm thinking about it, there is an argument to connecting all the pieces of lettuce into one mesh. I don't think it should break anything because then we could just modify it as a one piece. Uh, we do lose a bit of control though, but I'll do it just for the sake of this or I'll try it. So we take all these, we join, let's see what happens. It might mess something up. Yes, it does. Why does it mess something up? Probably because of the volume. So good experiment there. Uh, I guess we're going to do it individually for now. So just take those faces, bring them down. And I think the overall goal uh, other than positioning, what's going to make this look realistic is a hamburger is like very compressed, right? Uh, there shouldn't be gaps of air in between. So we just want this to get as squished as possible. And then if we do some like repositioning and stuff like this, it's going to help it look realistic. So again, mess around with the proportional editing. The longer you take to do this, probably the more realistic results you can probably get out of this. So I'm going to lift some sections up some down, and then for the overall object, I think I'm just gonna move this in a little. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Um, couple things we can do to the, um, by the way, there's some weird artifacts if you have a, a reference image in the background. Of course it doesn't matter, but since we're not gonna render that, but just interesting. A couple things to make it look a bit better. Let's mess with the lettuce uh, material. Um, so the color that's going to base color, I wanna mess with that. So I'm gonna do a hue saturation a value situation. Uh, so now we can, you know, how bright is the lettuce, etc. And I guess this should also be going to the volume since it's inheriting it. Um, I want to make this, I don't know, it kind of depends on your burger. Do I want it to be like saturated or desaturated? I think the saturation's fine. I want to take the value down a bit because right now it's starting to, it, right now it's looking like the lettuce is much brighter than it should be, in my opinion. And again, we need to bring this lettuce down is our goal. We want it to look as compressed as possible. Because uh, that's what physics would do again. And we just want to move our bun downwards. Okay, cool. Uh, we can also execute another trick uh, that we talked about last time. So that's the object info. So this is going to give us the random. It's going to give us a different value between 0 and 1 for each of the objects that have this material. There are three users, right? Three pieces of lettuce. Each one's going to get a number like this. And then what we can do with it is we can either vary the hue. So some pieces of lettuce are a tiny bit more yellow. Uh, which I think is kind of a good way to think about it. And we can also change value and stuff like that. So for example, we're going to do a map range because right now this is 0 to 1. We want to constrain it to something like, well, hue is going from like, I don't know, 0.49 to 0.51. You can experiment with that. So the hue, which should be 0.5, can go as low as, you know, minus 0.1 or as much as plus 0.1. And that should just add in a tiny bit of variation. Uh, it's more noticeable if we go down. Then you get some like purple pieces of lettuce and stuff like that. Uh, which is why we keep it kind of subtle. Uh, we can do the same thing again, but this time for the value. And this is just things that will add in a tiny bit of realism. Uh, we want the value to be centered at 0.8. Uh, so we can have them go as low as 0.7 and as high as 0.85. Just so there's variation, maybe visible variation, but nothing crazy. Okay, that is looking pretty good. I'm just going to do one final modification because we literally have a lettuce sticking out of the thing, which ain't a good time. There we go. And then finally, I guess there's an argument for putting lettuce on the bottom as well, since I guess our reference does. Uh, but I don't like I know that's what the reference shows. And I guess that's like technically uh, correct. I've never had a burger where they put in lettuce on the bottom as well. I don't know if they're lazy or whatever, uh, but this is usually what they stick with. So um, I think we are happy with this burger. At any time, you can go back and change any of our procedural settings. A lot of this can be uh, gone back to and modified. Like remember, just the bun strength is you know something we can go back to. The seed variation, the sesame seed variation, stuff like this. Uh, but for now, I think I'm happy with this. So uh, let's dress up our scene and move on to rendering. Yay! Let's take a moment to appreciate what we've done. We've made a hamburger that looks pretty realistic, even from close up. I mean, we do need to compress it a bit more. That's just set dressing. But in theory, we have a very good looking hamburger. And if you see it from not super up close, it just looks real. The closer we get, you know, it breaks a little, but it's pretty good. You, it, you know, if I was doing another pass of this, I'd definitely do condiments and ketchup and stuff like this. Uh, but for now, let's do some set dressing. 
which I keep saying. Uh, so I'm going to put in a plane, just like a thing that this burger can sit on. And I think what I want to do with this scene, I'm just trying to pick the best camera angle. Like, which way do we want to render from? Probably one of these directions. So you take the opposite wall, you extrude upwards, just so it has like a backdrop. You bevel it. So this is just like a basic lighting um, setup, right? You shade smooth. So it's kind of like we're doing this in the studio or something like this. Make sure that's shade smooth. Uh, do we have a camera? We do not. So let's make a camera. And this is like literally how I do all the renders you see at the beginning of the uh, tutorials. I just kind of do this process really quickly. It doesn't take that long. Okay, so something like this. We can always rotate the burger later. I want the camera to be very zoomed in. So the focal length, instead of moving the camera closer, I just want to have it zoom in. Um, which also changes like the way the burger looks. Like uh, things tend to look a bit more flattering. Uh, sometimes if you zoom in rather than come up close, but sometimes you could do the opposite effect intentionally. Okay, so we have that, and just so I don't see any of the nonsense in the background, viewport display, pass or part out, and let's see what that looks like. Okay, cool. Um, final things you can play around with, the world settings. Um, do you want to change the HDRI? Which one do we have right now? I think we have the one I was hovering over. Uh, this is a good time to play with different lighting scenarios, different HDRIs. I think this one actually makes it look a whole lot better, a whole lot more realistic. And remember, with an HDRI, which is a spherical image, you can rotate it uh, to get different lighting uh, conditions. And now the light's coming from this way. Uh, we could have the light coming from above. I don't know. I mean, I guess... Uh, you play around with it, but I really like the way this looks without, you know, messing around with it too much. Just some basic stuff. So, uh, let's do a tiny little scene. I'm thinking like a 45 second render, or 45 frame, 45 second render, we'd be sitting around here for a while, but not really, uh, because this video is sponsored by a render farm, but we'll get back to that in a second. Um, 45 frames seems okay. Uh, what I want for this animation, nothing complicated. I think I just want the burger spinning and maybe, uh, you know, getting larger. We'll see what we want with that. Um, before we do this, just a tiny thing. If you are done, like you don't want any more procedural control and you just want to like set this in, uh, first of all, I'll just do a save just for that. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to call this burger final. Yay. Uh, once you're happy with this and you know that you don't need to mess around with anything more, especially if you send it to a render farm uh, that isn't yet compatible with 2.93, which I think most of them aren't. Um, but just to be on the safe side, what you want to do is uh, something that uses geometry nodes, uh, a way to apply geometry nodes, because right now if you were to go to the modifier, you click apply on this, you see the sesame seeds go away. Uh, the way you do this is you type in, I think it's called make instances real. Yeah, or you could just hit control A, make instances real. And that's just going to put a bunch of objects on here, which we could join. That shouldn't mess with it too much. We can join it into one big sesame seed as long as we pick an active object. Let's try that again. So now we have, whoa, whoa, would not recommend that. Apparently we've, we've created a mess. Um, make sure you make instances real. This is going to make all of them an object, which yes, becomes a cumbersome if you have a lot of particles or a lot of points and stuff like this. But for now, just make sure you do this or render farms and stuff like this will not work and stuff like that. Um, additionally, we are going to make a empty and this empty is going to control um, the animation of the rest of this. So uh, what I want to do is I'm going to go into wireframe to make sure I see everything. I'm going to select all these objects minus the plane and then shift click the empty. Whoops. I want to make sure the empty is the selected objects. I guess that's control click. And then I think you can just do control P parent, uh, which is going to freeze for a second because we have a lot of objects. Let's wait on that. There we go. Now we have an empty and now we should be able to move this around as a single entity, uh, which is perfect for animation. So what do we want from this? Let's keep it simple. I'm going to, let's say on the last frame, or no, let's say on frame 40, so there's five frames of buffer, uh, we keyframe the location, rotation, and scale. And then on frame zero, we want it to like rotate by 180 degrees. Or you know what? Let's have it rotate by like 300. And before we do this, let's go to solid mode. We're going to have it rotate by 360 degrees just so it comes in spinning in. So I'm going to keyframe the rotation. I also want the scale to be zero. Um and we could keyframe uh, the scale, and you can mess around with the location. But you can see this is gonna make it look like the burger's just coming out of the abyss. 
Um, and additionally, what's gonna make this look super cool is a bit of smoothing. So go to graph editor, and then you're gonna see any animation we did here. If we rescale this, um, our uh, scaling, whatever, all of this is in graph form. So if we take this, we go to individual uh, centers, we can then scale everything by two on the x-axis. So again, I'm just SX2, scale on the x-axis by two, and that's just gonna add in a bit of smoothing to our Bezier. And it makes it look like it's really popping. So here's the uh, before animation. And then here is the after. It's just much more snappy. Okay. Um, and now that I think we're done with our scene, let's prepare this thing for a render farm. So uh, we finally made it. I don't think I've sworn too much in this. So I think, I think we're good. Uh, this tutorial, this whole series, I guess, in some sense, is sponsored by Concierge Render, uh, which is a render farm that I've used for various projects in the past. And I'm using it uh, to show you how to render this. So... Uh, let me show you how you would render a project like this uh, that we've made from beginning to end on a render farm. So uh, before just taking this blend file and just uploading it uh, to Concierge, uh, you do need to do a bit of work. Uh, there's an add-on for this, but it's really just like two button clicks. So first thing you're going, going to do is you're going to go to File, Clean Up, and clean up all your like unused blocks. This is just so that your file size is smaller and we're not calculating for things we do not care about. Second thing is we are gonna go to external data and click automatically pack into blend. And you can see packed five files. So any image, so like the tomato image, the HDRI, any like asset we used for this is now packed into the blend file. So we can upload a single blend file to the render farm instead of that plus images and stuff like this. And I guess technically a third thing is whatever settings you want here, you could change it later on concierge, but uh, any settings you want, uh, you could, you know, just set them here. So I want, I don't know, 200 samples. I mean, whatever you can, you pick your frame rate, you pick your render, um, I think you even pick your file type here, although I'm fine with like PNG and all this. Uh, so make sure you do all that. And then somewhere, I think for me, it's going to be on the desktop. You're going to have a blend file called burger final yay. And just to make sure you want to make sure that it's like 15 point something megabytes, right? Uh, this indicates that the images were actually packed in, right? We actually have a file size that's larger than like a couple kilobytes. So uh, now let's go over to the concierge render website, which there's a link for in the description if you're interested, but I will meet you in a second over at the website. Okay, we've made it to concierge render. I've blurred out my username and password because, you know, I don't want you guys knowing that. Either way, you make an, you make an account, you click sign in or you know, you make make account, uh, you're gonna have some kind of balance depending on how much money you put in here. And uh, the idea is we are rendering extremely quickly uh, for what is hopefully not a very expensive cost. Now, the bigger your scene is, of course, the more this is gonna cost, but for something like this hamburger scene, uh, it's something like 200 samples for 45 frames, it shouldn't be a big deal. So uh, this is basically your dashboard. How do you upload a thing and get it started? So. It's pretty obvious. You go to upload and launch renders. Again, you want to make sure you've done all that prep work on your blend file or you have the add-on. You go to upload files. And what are we going to upload? Well, again, we do not need a folder uh, because we've packed everything in there. If you have a simulation, uh, that's the kind of thing you need a folder for, right? Because you have your simulation cache. Um, I'm going to type in, what did we call it? Burger final yay. Click open and it's going to start uploading. And hopefully I don't need to cut because it's uh, it seems like I'm, it's uploading pretty quickly. I've upgraded my Wi-Fi recently. I got this new antenna and it's, it's working like a charm. So burger final yay. It's here. We're going to go to actions. We're going to go to launch render. Why? Because we want to launch a render. I know it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. And what, what it's doing right now is it's basically looking at our scene. Um, not only, you know, putting it on their server, uh, but also being like, what sample count is it using? What uh, render settings is it? Eh what render settings is it using, et cetera. And you can see that when it's done analyzing, we get this menu that we can pick a bunch of options for. So first of all, render platform, I'm gonna choose the newest version of Blender that is supported. So in my case, 2.91. Um, as long as you did that make instances real thing, it's not a big deal. Or you can wait for geometry nodes to be compatible, but that's probably gonna take a while because it's still an alpha and stuff like this. Uh, pick the newest uh, Blender version. Render engine, I'm using uh, Cycles, so let's just use Cycles. Uh, render type, this part's pretty important. You can actually render a preview, um, so you don't need to pay anything for this. This is just to make sure that it's rendering what you expect it to render. Um, in my case, I know we set it up correctly, so there's no point. I'm gonna render an animation, and then, <clears throat> and then you wanna go to the next section of frames, resolution, etc. So we go there. We say start frame, end frame. You can see it's already imported that in successfully. However, if you want to only render a section of it, you could just type in, oh, only the first 15 frames or whatever. But I'm going to do the full animation, okay? 1 through 45. 
Next, uh, we have resolution. Do you want 1080p, 4K, native resolution, whatever? Um, I'm just going to pick, I mean, you could either do native resolution, which is what we put in our project settings, or you could do custom resolution or 1080p. I mean, in this case, they're all the same. However, if you put in like, I don't know, you have a very special resolution, uh, you might need to put this in manually. Uh, in my case, a lot of these end up working. So 1080p, 1920 by 1080. And then the sample count, we can also change here. Uh, you don't need to like go back in and re-upload a one file with a different sample count number. Um, it imports it in. I'm fine with 200. I don't need to edit it. Okay. Next down the line, hardware. What hardware do you want to use? This is where it gets pretty technical. Uh, point is, some some hardware is going to be faster than others, but some hardware <laughs> is also going to be more expensive than others. So it's basically dependent on you. Do you want something fast that's a bit more expensive or slower but cheaper? Um, I'm just going to go with the basic thing. Nothing to think about. Okay. So click render, and then let's see what happens. So we've picked all our settings. It's basically getting queued up. And uh, here we go. Render launch, burger, final, yay, etc. cetera. Um, and it will prompt us to go over to the job manager. So let's do that. And you can see, and by the way, I've uh, rendered a bunch of projects on this uh, in the past, uh, which is why you see all of these. You're probably only going to see a single one if it's your first time. Um, we have our project. You can go to view details, and it's going to tell you a bunch of stuff about it. So... Uh, for example, what kind of thing are we using? We're using the basic one and a half dollars per node per hour, which is basically saying it's on these machines or on some number of machines. This is how much it will cost to run uh, this amount of time in calculation. Uh, we also have, it's an animation type, average frame duration, average cost. And uh, right now it's gonna, you, you can see the status bar. It's gonna be rendering um, and it's going to keep updating the cost of this. So I think what I'm gonna do, I mean, I kind of want to not cut, <laughs> but you know, whatever. I'm going to cut. I'll be back in like 30 seconds when this is done. Okay, our render is complete. How long did it take? Well, it started at this time and ended at this time, so it took like 20 seconds. Um, In contrast, by the way, if I was to render this on my computer, it'd probably take this amount of time per frame, probably even a bit more, so it'd be like 45 to 60 times uh, slower. Um, and this only becomes more and more useful the bigger your scene is with the more frames, etc. Um, and you can see um, it didn't take a long time. It was less than half a dollar is 40 cents. And uh, usually, as long as your scene's not huge, these prices tend to be very low. So I already had like, I don't know, 27 something dollars. And it's only dug in 41 cents. And you can see, uh, these are all the frames that are done. You can either download them one by one, like a lunatic, <laughs> doesn't make any sense, or you could download all of them at the same time. And it should give us a zip file. Um, I'm gonna save it on the desktop. Um, it should download pretty quickly. Um, and when you actually play out this PNG sequence, I mean, I guess you're seeing the render right now. Uh, this is what it gives you. Basically, it should be the same output as if, or the same output as if you were to, this is what I'm trying to say, uh, render it on one computer, uh, but the only difference is it doesn't take uh, forever. So there you go, Concierge Render is the sponsor of this video and th that that's a way to render. So anyways, thank you for watching the hamburger tutorial series. It was a long haul, but I think I taught a lot of tricks and I wanted to do it properly with a good blend of proceduralism and uh, also some like textures, just, you know, <laughs> basically just ripping images off of Google Images. I wanted to make kind of the most realistic in some sense hamburger that you can make without like photo scanning or photogrammetry or something like this. So anyways, uh, thank you for watching all four parts of the series. Very cool of you, and I think at this point I'm going to bid you adieu. So, see ya.